Oh, here we go again. It's time for us to take another crack at putting SCP-682 six feet under once and for all. If you've been following this channel for any amount of time, then there's one thing you know for certain. SCP-682 is harder to kill than pretty much, well, anything. We've made multiple videos on the Foundation's failed attempts to finally terminate the beast, and we've made a video with some of your ideas on how to finally slay the monster. And considering you're watching this video right now, you can probably guess how that went. Now it's time for one more run at the Death Star. And once again, it's with your ideas from comments and community post responses. Let's see if any of them can help us finally put this ill-tempered reptile to rest. If we can't, well, we're not blaming you, but it's also your fault. Let the community termination attempts commence. Anas McBride suggested, ask the witch child. SCP-239, also known as the witch child, is one of the most dangerous and powerful anomalies out there. She's a small girl with unparalleled reality-warping mental abilities, so powerful that her very brainwaves alone can be passively fatal. However, the problem is, her power is so potentially dangerous that she's forever kept in a kind of medically-induced anomalous coma. Dr. Alto Kleth thinks she's so dangerous he's even campaigning to have her terminated. As a result, the O5 Council has forbidden any cross-testing between 682 and 239. Fearing the consequence of 682 gaining 239's powers and becoming a truly unstoppable threat capable of causing an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. Syed Zamin Ali Shah Kazimi Mushadi suggested, kill him with SCP-734. This is an interesting one. SCP-734, also known as the baby, is an anomaly that causes a painful degenerative disease that eventually disintegrates the entire body and kills the victim if they so much as come into contact with the baby or its fluids. However, based on cross-tests with other similar touch-it-and-die anomalies like SCP-409, the contagious crystal, we can probably guess how exactly this would go down. In all likelihood, the baby's anomalous effects would infect and destroy large portions of SCP-682's body. However, at this point, 682 would adapt to the threat and begin to reverse it and heal. Even worse, it's likely that 682 would steal the ability for a limited time and become deadly to the touch. Caden Griffin suggested, Why don't you use the Dragon Slayer to terminate 682? It has proved itself many times in fights with LSAs. SCP-5514 The Dragon Slayer is essentially a giant fighting robot designed to take down killer kaijus with its plethora of state-of-the-art anomalous weapons and defenses. However, we'd still argue that while it could definitely help in immobilizing 682 during a rampage, it doesn't have much of a chance of actually killing it. Let's look at SCP-001, the Gate Guardian, a supernatural warrior with a blade hotter than the sun, capable of cleaving atoms in half. Even he couldn't kill SCP-682. So, a robotic approximation with only a fraction of the Gate Guardian's power is probably not going to have any real chance of killing 682. I'm a Chuckster 48 suggested, make it bite its tongue so hard that it just destroys itself. While we can certainly attest from personal experience that this really, really hurts, we worry that if ever 682 bit its own tongue really hard, it'd just drive it into a state of murderous rage. Though we do take a small piece of satisfaction in knowing its tongue would probably be in distress for a few minutes afterwards, it's unlikely to wipe out the beast once and for all. Lazy Royce suggested, how about we just put SCP-682 in 2317's cell? SCP-2317 is an old wooden door that functions as a portal into the domain of the planet-destroying monster known as the Devourer of Worlds, a being that many believe is associated with the Scarlet King and will inevitably escape and cause an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. While you may be thinking, perhaps it'll kill 682, it's more likely that it'll collaborate, seeing as they both want the same thing, namely, to kill everyone. If you let 682 in, chances are it'll come back through the door with the Devourer right on its tail. Then, it's all of our problems. Guest 123116 suggested, drop him in Russia so they can terminate him. The Foundation has technically already tried this. They dropped 682 into SCP-3930, a patch of literal non-existence in Russia that causes anything that goes inside of it to cease to exist. And afterwards, he was fine. So yeah, dropping him anywhere in Russia is probably just going to get a bunch of innocent Russian civilians killed. Meischer said, The Foundation shouldn't worry about how to kill him, but how to stop his ability to adapt. 
I would suggest typing SCP-682 no adaptability juice or something like that into SCP-294 and then kill him by any means. Which should kill him forever. An interesting theory. But what if he simply adapts to SCP-682 no adaptability juice? Then we'd really all be in trouble. Mario TGP said, Give him a Twitter account, he'll be cancelled instantly for his spicy opinions. SCP-682 would cancel Twitter itself for not having opinions that are spicy enough. Sorry, Jack. SCP-096, still sore about losing the battle, we assume, said, Let him fight the Queen of England. After all, she's immortal too. We definitely think it would be interesting to see SCP-682 go head-to-head -head with the Queen of England. Based on all the knighting she does, we know that she at least has a sword, though we don't know if that sword is as powerful as the one wielded by the Gate Guardian. But regardless of the outcome, the battle would definitely change history. Every history book would simply read, SCP-682 punched the Queen. Everything else would just be a footnote. Noah Cordero said, Use SCP-2935 to kill the lizard. As you can see in the video, he will die. SCP-2935, also known as O-Death, is probably one of the scariest and deadliest SCPs out there. It killed an entire alternate dimension, including an alternate SCP-682. The problem is, putting R-682 into 2935's alternate reality could lead to the destruction of our entire dimension. Why is that? Because if 682 was somehow able to return to our world from the world of 2935, it could bring the spirit of death itself back with it and kill us all in the process. Explorando con Beto 1 suggested, SCP-682 vs. Lady Dimitrisk. While Resident Evil 8's Lady Dimitrisk has certainly captured all of our hearts, we don't think she'll be bringing home the W on this one. Lady Dimitrisk has a powerful adaptive ability of her own with a high resistance to damage, impressive regenerative abilities, and a number of offensive capabilities, from huge claws to a powerful dragon form. However, considering she wasn't able to defeat Ethan Winters, she probably wouldn't be able to defeat SCP-682 either. However, in her dragon form, SCP-682 may finally join the rest of us in developing a crush. Or is that being crushed? Anyway, moving on. Jonathan Peckany suggested, just ask SCP-343 on how to destroy it, or even better, ask if he could destroy it. It's an idea so good that the Foundation actually tried it, and it went about as well as you can expect. When the SCP known as God entered the containment chamber, he couldn't even see 682 in there, as though the creature was somehow totally invisible to him. When God eventually got bored and left, they told him that he was in there to destroy 682. He simply replied, He's not one of mine. Deal with him yourself. Interpret that how you will. 12 Escobar Blanca's Eddie Saul suggested they could send him to Area 37 for the sisters to experiment with. SCP-1765 The Sisters are a trio of terrifyingly powerful reality warpers that have taken over Area 37 and spend their days tormenting everyone inside with their twisted experiments. Using them to try to terminate 682 leads to similar problems with using the Witch Child or the Devourer of Worlds. If they decide to team up rather than fighting, or the sisters take over 682, we'd all be effectively doomed. Kiroya suggested, Would the ants from SCP-743 tear 682 apart? The Foundation actually tried this, getting 682 to consume chocolate from the SCP-743 fountain, incurring the wrath of its flesh-eating ants. However, 682 developed an adaptation that gave it a long, anteater-like tongue that it then used to consume the ants faster than they could consume it. And even worse, the chocolate seemed to enhance its regenerative abilities even more for several days afterwards. Ball 2222 suggested, write the name in the death note. Great idea! We'll put it into practice as soon as you can tell us SCP-682's real name. It may come as a surprise, but its parents didn't actually name it the hard-to-destroy reptile. Steven Vieri suggested, I thought that maybe we should put him in a giant blender, and then when he's in small pieces, put lava in the blender, so it will incinerate him, then put nuclear waste into the blender and repeat that until there's no more left of him. After the cooking whisks last time, we feel obliged to include at least one attempt to kill SCP-682 with oversized kitchen equipment in every video about him. However, this attempt would probably go about as well as the last one, we're afraid. Extreme physical trauma by conventional means, like burning and dismemberment, has never been successful in the past. 
and the Foundation is extremely hesitant to use anything radioactive on the beast, in case it adapts and adds deadly radiation to its own arsenal. Mr. Master IQ suggested, just take away his plot armor. You can pry SCP-682's plot armor from its cold, dead claws, and as we've already learned, making those claws cold and dead seems next to impossible. Moving on, JC3 suggested, hmm, if anyone can't beat the Undying Lizard, why not Omni-Man? I mean, he did kill all the Guardians of the Globe, of course he can kill SCP-682. Omni-Man from the comic and TV series Invincible is undeniably a formidable opponent, given he's able to destroy superhero teams, cities, and even planets. However, one of the few enemies to give Omni-Man a genuine run for his money is a genetically enhanced kaiju known as Hail Mary. Given that first, 682 has taken on being stronger than Omni-Man, like the Gate Guardian, and lived, and second that Omni-Man has struggled with monsters before, chances are he probably couldn't permanently kill this one either. Heikani Havea suggested, kill SCP-053, then 682 will be sad and die. Wow, now that's cold-blooded. However, even if this did work, it's important for you to remember that it's impossible to actually kill SCP-053, also known as the child or the little girl. Part of her anomalous abilities is that anyone who attempts to kill her will themselves immediately die during the process, normally due to a heart attack. So this method would result in a pile of dead Foundation personnel and no progress. Jerry Zhang said, mush peanut butter on it. This would definitely work if 682 had some kind of severe peanut allergy. After all, anaphylactic shock is no laughing matter. However, in the far more likely event that this will have no effect on SCP-682, you will likely just die with your hands covered in peanut butter. Andrew Mills suggested, My idea? Have several Xenomorphs, Predators, and Daleks, yes, that's a Doctor Who reference, take 682 on. Once again, in all likelihood, this would have no effect. 682 has survived blades and lasers, the primary weapons of the Predators and Daleks, and spends the majority of its life immersed in powerful acid, so the Xenomorph would hold no surprises for it. Sadly, this three-way team-up would be no match for 682, and even if it did defeat him, whoever wins, we, um, well, you know how it goes. Mateo Huang suggested, maybe just destroy reality. This... This might be the thing that finally kills SCP-682, but considering it's already survived being thrown into pure nothingness in Russia, it may just result in it being one of the only survivors of a full destruction of reality. We, on the other hand, would all be killed, though in a sense we wouldn't have to deal with SCP-682 anymore. So maybe that's a type of winning? And finally, Blind Honor suggested, would Saitama be a good way to eliminate it? He is One Punch Man, after all. Of anyone we've covered in this series, Saitama from One Punch Man would probably be the most likely to kill SCP-682, especially if he was taking the battle seriously. After all, he has killed planet-destroying monsters before with barely any effort. The only real question is whether he could be bothered to come down to a Foundation containment site and fight it. Saitama hasn't been known to be a very motivated guy. But of course, like with anything, there's the risk that 682 would survive and gain his powers. Which would be bad. Awesome, but bad. Do you have new ideas for how SCP-682 could be killed? Do you think you have the key to finally bringing this beast to a well-deserved end? Let us know down in the comments, and keep an eye on our community post for more SCP questions like this one so you can be featured in the next video. There is something maddening about a repetitive, consistent sound, don't you agree? The narrator of Edgar Allan Poe's The Telltale Heart is driven mad by the non-stop beating of a heart coming from beneath his floorboards. But even something less horrible than a disembodied heartbeat can fray a person's nerves. Superficially less horrible, anyway. Something as simple as, say, the relentless ticking of a clock. After all, what could be more frightening than a reminder of the sands of time passing through our fingers, of the finite steps on life's long and winding road? We have the answer to that question. The scariest thing of all is the monster waiting on the other side of the road, twisted and hungry. The thing that strikes when the ticking eventually stops, when time is up. Tick. Talk, tick, talk. Many years ago, 
A clockmaker in the German town of Freiburg was renowned for his ability to produce exquisite personalized clocks for his clientele all across town, the country, and even beyond. His unparalleled constructions made him the only man to reach out to when it came to getting your hands on a beautiful, ornate timepiece that would ease the anxieties of the passing hours. He ate, slept, and breathed clocks. It was his life, his calling. As such, the clockmaker had grown accustomed to the sound of ticking. He heard it in the morning when he awoke to the cry of his cuckoo clock. He listened to it all day in his workshop as he repaired and constructed clocks of all shapes and sizes, and it was the sound that lulled him to sleep at night after each long, hard day. It gave life a pleasant rhythm. One day, however, he noticed a particularly loud, repetitive sound had permeated his home. It was rhythmic, like the ticking of his clocks, but harsher somehow. It did not gently tick, but rather cracked, like the way his knees popped when a harsh winter was coming. Something in it made his stomach ache with dread. He began taking apart every clock in his workshop, looking for the source of the sound, but still, it persisted. He sat there at his desk, surrounded by gears and pieces of wood, glass, and metal. And still, the sound pounded against his eardrums. Tick, tock, tick, tock. The clockmaker was stumped by the mysterious ticking noise. It felt too real, too vivid to be some kind of hallucination. He would have bet every clock he ever made that the noise was coming from outside of his head. He was a man so astute in his clockmaking abilities that he could tell his own creations apart in the dark from the mere timber of their ticking. But here, he was in the presence of an alien force. This frightening, almost predatory sound that lingered in his periphery, always somewhere, but not confined to any fixed point. He was reminded vaguely of Peter Pan, of the crocodile that had eaten Captain Hook's hand and alarm clock, which survived and continued ticking in the literal belly of the beast. Hook, a vicious pirate captain, would become a gibbering wreck when the ticking sound got closer. Did he fear the predator whom the ticking foretold, or the passage of time that pushed him further into the reaper's fold in the otherwise immortal plain of Neverland? Tick, tock, tick, tock. The clockmaker's search continued. He turned his workplace upside down and inside out in pursuit of the seemingly sourceless ticking. He checked every hiding place, every closet, cupboard, cubbyhole, and cabinet. Nothing. He moved the furniture tied up the curtains, rolled up all the carpets, nothing. In his desperation, he took a claw hammer from his toolbox and began prying the rusty nails from the ground before peeling up the floorboards and checking the dusty spider-infested spaces underneath. Perhaps some mechanism had fallen down there, or had always been there, just ticking away. There had to be something down there, but no, only dirt, insects, and shadows. Maybe he was going mad, maybe it was tinnitus, or the indelible impression that hearing years upon years of ticking had left in his mind, the way an image is burned into a plasma screen if it's left there for too long. Maybe it was some shadowy government agency trying to drive him mad with the use of some new sound-based torture device, aural terrorism, selective auditory subliminal mind control, Havana syndrome. The fizzling edges of sanity egged on by the invisible long-range CIA telesound beams. There had to be some kind of explanation. But whatever the case, the sound persisted. Tick, tock, tick, tock. He couldn't stay there in the dismembered ruins of his prestigious clockmaking shop any longer. He was clearly under a lot of stress here. Not healthy, not good for the mind. He decided to close the shop for a few days and go visit his daughter and her family. Some time with his beloved relatives would soothe his frayed nerves. So he packed his bag and made the trip, hoping that leaving work behind for a few days would also loosen up his mind. But the entire drive to his daughter's house, he could have sworn he still heard the sound, keeping perfect time as it cracked again and again. He shook his head, scolding himself for imagining things. There was nothing in the car that could be making that noise. He'd focused on it too much. Surely that's why he was obsessing over it now. All this had a rational explanation, he simply thought himself. He'd simply thought himself into a corner on this one. 
Wouldn't that explain all of this? All just a trick in the mind of an overworked clockmaker sorely in need of a good sabbatical in the country. This wouldn't be forever. Tick, talk, tick, talk. The clockmaker's daughter greeted him at the door with a warm embrace and a hearty meal, and for a little while, he relaxed. The sound of good company and laughter drowned out the infernal ticking. He began to entertain the notion that perhaps the ticking had been a good thing. It had been a long time since he'd seen his daughter, and that ticking, as frightening as it had been, was also the only thing that pushed him away from the workshop for a while. He was somewhat grateful for a good excuse to take time off. Perhaps that was what it was all about, a reminder to take it easy. After a weekend off, he'd be right as rain, surely. But that night, as he tried to fall asleep, the sound was there again, taunting him, keeping his eyes open wide and his heart rate climbing. Was it the dark of the room magnifying his hearing, intensifying that awful ticking, or was it louder and closer than ever before? It felt as though an invisible clock, like so many he'd made before, was hanging over him. But what was holding it? That awful, awful sound. Like the bubbles popping in the synovial fluids of a person's aged and crumbling joints. Too organic. Too fleshy. And it just kept getting louder and closer. Louder and closer. Louder and closer. Tick. Talk. Tick, talk, tick, talk, tick, talk, tick, talk, tick, talk. Until suddenly, it went silent. He breathed a sigh of relief and closed his eyes. The clockmaker's daughter woke to the sound of her father's piercing guttural screams. She ran to his room to find the bedsheet soaked with blood. The bedroom window shattered and her father gone without a trace. She went to the police the next day, but they could do nothing for her. Her father had not been the victim of an ordinary murderer or thief, but something outside the realm of understanding. It was something ancient, something mysterious, something monstrous, something anomalous. Though the police could do nothing, another organization was secretly on the case, the SCP Foundation. After the clockmaker's disappearance, operatives searched the area and discovered the culprit which they captured and designated SCP-4975. SCP-4975 is a humanoid entity with bird-like features, the most notable of which is a sharp, pointed beak. Its body is long and thin, with bony limbs with tapered points, with no discernible digits of any kind. Its body, including its beak, is covered with a thick, hard layer of skin. The entity's most notable feature is not its appearance, however, but in its skeleton, particularly its spine. The cervical vertebrae of the creature are not interconnected and are capable of independent movement. They rotate one vertebra at a time, from back to front in order, all the way up to the entity's head, in a particular rhythm. This produces the clicking or cracking sound that is so terribly familiar to its intended victims. It repeats the motion constantly, over and over again, only stopping when it's preparing to attack its chosen prey. SCP-4975 does not kill impulsively, simply selecting a convenient victim. Instead, it stalks its prey for months at a time, sometimes even a year, following them in darkness, hiding just out of sight. The only sign of its presence is that sound, the clicking, cracking, tick, tock, tick, tock of its bones as it bides its time knowing that it can wait as long as it needs or wants to before it strikes. When it's ready to feast, it will beat and tear at the victim's body with the tapered points of its limbs, shredding the flesh and pecking at it much like a vulture rips at a fresh carcass. Then it can savor its meal, using the body as food for about three months before it needs to hunt again. Though its exact age is unknown, it is theorized that the creature is hundreds if not thousands of years old. Written evidence of its existence has been traced back as far as the 1500s. There are mentions of a creature resembling SCP-4975 throughout German folklore, appearing in carvings, paintings, folk tales, and nursery rhymes. One such nursery rhyme was discovered and translated by the Foundation during the research process. Though its rhyme scheme was lost when it was translated to English, 
the eerie feeling it evokes was not. The rhyme goes, tick tock, the cuckoo clock ticks, cuckoo, the bird inside sings, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. As it ticks the time, so ticks your heart. May you live long as you hear its song. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. Listen close for when it stops, the hatchling comes out of its home. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick. Did you hear it? Did it stop? My child, it meant your time was up. The research team theorized that this nursery rhyme, and others like it, was used to warn children about potential indicators of danger from SCP-4975 and teach them to be wary of its hunting patterns. Knowledge, after all, is one of the best weapons in anyone's arsenal when it comes to the anomalous. Without much more knowledge than this little poem provides, and what they had observed prior to SCP-4975's capture, the SCP Foundation did its best to create adequate containment measures for the creature. Currently, SCP-4975 is kept in a standard steel containment cell and is prohibited from any direct human contact. It can be observed via security footage, but no human beings are permitted to go inside, lest they serve as the creature's next meal. If a containment breach occurs, any personnel that report hearing a repetitive cracking or ticking sound are to be isolated until the entity has been captured and placed back in its cell, or until the sound stops. Though SCP-4975 is currently contained, there is a chance that its captive state does not actually make it any less lethal. After a harrowing incident that sent many attending researchers to the on-site psychologist's office, the Foundation was given reason to believe that containing it does not actually stop it from hunting. On September 16, 2002, something horrible happened near the Black Forest in Germany. A team of Foundation operatives had been placed in the area to monitor a man from Freiburg who had complained to the local police about a clicking sound that had been following him around for quite some time. Over the course of four months of being unable to escape the sound, or the feeling that he was being watched no matter where he went, he had become convinced that someone was stalking him. It was a bizarre situation, and he wasn't certain how his stalker was making this maddening sound, but he believed his life to be in danger. Concerned that this could be the work of SCP-4975, the Foundation operatives took him into custody. The police were given a cover story, claiming that the man was experiencing a sense of paranoia as well as auditory hallucinations as a result of side effects from chemotherapy. Once the Foundation operatives explained to the man that they meant him no harm, believed him about his fears, and wished to help, he opened up about his experiences. He told the operatives that, in addition to the sound and the feeling of something following him, he had seen a monstrous figure in the woods. He had kept the details to himself when speaking to the police, afraid they would have him committed rather than listening to him. The operatives asked him to lead them to the place where he had seen the monster, and he agreed. The man led the team to a densely wooded part of the forest, trees blocking out the sunlight, until their surroundings became as dark as if it were the middle of the night. As they walked deeper and deeper into the forest, the man became increasingly anxious. His breath came in short, strained gasps, his eyes darted from tree to tree, and he jumped at the slightest sound of a twig snapping beneath someone's foot or branches rustling in a gust of wind. Suddenly, mid-stride, he froze. His eyes were wide. His face was white as a sheet. With a trembling hand, he pointed toward a nearby tree. In a voice so faint it was almost a whisper, he said, Sir! The operatives turned to look, but saw nothing there. The man repeated, Sir! But they couldn't see anything but the trees. The man stumbled back, going weak at the knees from pure terror, and continued to point at the empty space next to the tree. Just as one operative was turning to another to comment that their witness must be out of his mind, the man suddenly collapsed onto the ground as if an invisible, powerful force had thrown him down. The man screamed for help, struggling against the unseen attacker as it slashed at his face and his chest, tearing through fabric and skin, blood spraying across the forest floor. Two officers drew their weapons, firing at where they guessed the assailant might be, but their bullets ricocheted uselessly off nearby tree trunks. Another rushed to the man on the ground, grabbing him under the arms and attempting to pull him out of harm's way. However, the man would not budge. 
as the invisible force held him in place, shredding through his stomach as it fought to keep its prey. Afraid to rip open the stomach wound any further, the operatives quickly ceased his attempts to move the man. Instead, he pulled out his weapon and did the only merciful thing he could think to do. He shot the local man in the head, putting him out of his misery before he was ripped to shreds. The operatives watched, some in silent shock, some continuing to fire their weapons, some vomiting from sheer disgust, as strips of the dead man's flesh ripped off of bone and disappeared, one piece at a time. Meanwhile, thousands of miles away, surveillance footage of SCP-4975's containment site picked up some peculiar activity in the creature's cell. It stopped rotating its neck, which it had done almost constantly since being captured, and stared at the corner of its containment cell. Its eyes were wide, unblinking, and it did not move a muscle. It stayed still for several minutes, until it eventually broke the unsettling stillness to eat, greedily gobbling down slices of meat. There was one problem, though. The creature had not yet been fed that day. All Foundation operatives dispatched to Germany to investigate SCP-4975 were recalled back to their original sites, and additional research has been suspended until further notice. In light of this new information, a motion has been filed to reclassify the creature as Keter and potentially impossible to contain with the Foundation's current resources. As terrible as it is to admit, this is one monster the Foundation has not yet found a way to stop. They may have it locked in a cage, but it can still hunt anyone, anywhere, anytime it wants to. Wait a second. Shh. Be very, very quiet. What's that sound? In your room, right now. Listen closely. Shh. Tick, tick, tick. Do you hear it? Don't worry. Probably just a clock or a kitchen timer. Maybe it's just your imagination. Tick, tick, tick. Whatever it is, I'm sure you'll be fine. There's nothing dangerous about a weird sound from time to time. You don't have anything to fear unless it suddenly goes silent. That's when you're really in trouble. When you know SCP-4975 is about to strike to devour you alive. Wait, stop, hold your breath, don't make a single beep. Do you hear it? Neither do I. Like any other area in the United States, the state of Florida has a healthy share of urban legends and local myths. Take for example the legendary Swamp Ape, the region's Bigfoot equivalent. A hulking creature said to run amok in the state's many swamps and aquatic areas, identified by its strong, repugnant odor and deep, guttural throat calls. Or the ghosts of the St. Augustine Lighthouse, a grisly tale revolving around two young girls who drowned in the nearby sea while their mother was working the lighthouse, too distracted to hear the cries of her children as they were swallowed by the current and returned to the brine. It's rumored that on some nights, the twins' laughter and cries are heard from the top of the lighthouse. Not scary enough? What about the Devil's Chair? A seemingly ordinary bench located in the town of Casadaga that was supposedly built by the Devil himself. Every night, at midnight, the man in red returns to his bench, and if you sit beside him, he'll whisper wicked, horrible things into your ear, leaving you forever scarred and haunted by the experience. Just don't leave a drink behind when you run off the bench in terror, though. Another legend says that any unopened bottles left on the bench will mysteriously be opened and drained by the morning. Torturing damned souls for eternity makes you a thirsty guy, we guess. But to a seasoned viewer of SCP Explained, urban legends and local oddities might seem a bit mundane in comparison to the strange, inexplicable anomalies that the SCP Foundation regularly researches and contains. After all, the truth is almost always stranger than fiction, and if an actual anomaly gets picked up as an urban legend, the SCP Foundation is going to do everything in their power to shut it down, cover it up, and make the story a little more digestible for the general public. That means relying on the same tired tropes and cliches we've all heard before. Cursed dolls, Bigfoot-like creatures, ghost hitchhikers, we all know them. And as fun as they are, the most popular stories aren't always the most unique or interesting. And if you peer deeper underneath the surface, you can always find kernels of truth in the most commonplace of legends. For example, what's commonly referred to as Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, is actually SCP-1000, a super-intelligent prehistoric race of ape creatures known as the Children of the Night. 
who were slaughtered by early humans and forced to hide from the world in order to preserve their species. A cursed object or location? The Foundation deals with those all the time, and stories of ghosts are as commonplace in the anomalous world as they are in the ordinary one. But what about an anomaly that utilizes urban legends to further its own nefarious goals? One that's lifeblood is localized to a single area. Today on SCP Explained, we're going to be talking about SCP-3640, an anomaly that capitalizes on the interest and intrigue those urban legends generate, specifically those in the state of Florida. We already talked about the variety of weird and creepy stories the state calls its own, but what else is Florida known for? Tourism? Retirement communities? Beautiful summer weather? Slightly crazy individuals making news headlines for ridiculous reasons? How about Disney? That's right. The state of Florida is known for Walt Disney World, the granddaddy of all theme parks that brings in millions of tourist dollars annually and the hub for some of the most iconic characters and stories in the world. If you've ever been to Disney World, then you know about the costume characters that roam the park. Silent mascot costume renditions of your favorite TV and movie characters, posing for pictures and having fun with children. The park is practically infested with them. They seem inescapable. It's pretty understandable that some people are unsettled by mascots. They can sometimes be downright creepy with those unmoving expressions, giant heads, unnatural movements, and the faces of familiar fictional characters in the right context, a mascot can be just as scary as any horror movie monster or urban legend could ever be. Here's a situation for you. You've just landed at a Florida airport. You're ready to go to Disney World and enjoy a vacation after you've been worked to exhaustion as a junior researcher at the SCP Foundation. You want to get familiar with the state, but you're trying to cut down on your phone usage. After all, you're on vacation. Why not do things the old-fashioned way and unplug from electronics? You spot a brochure rack in the distance. Perfect. A paper hub for everything touristy in the area. Among the hundreds of jet skiing courses, beach information, and many golf pamphlets, one brochure in particular stands out to you. Maybe it's your background in the anomalous, but you just can't help yourself from picking up a booklet on Florida's urban legends. Knowing what's behind the curtain working for the SCP Foundation really makes these types of things more amusing. You've seen how the sausage was made, and it's a lot more terrifying than anything known to the general public. Heck, you know for a fact that the organization you work for has more than likely not covered up most of the actual incidents that inspired these local legends. Nonetheless, you pick up the brochure, interested in the self-guided tour of Florida's paranormal hotspots, and you're impressed to find that this booklet has it all. Everything from skunk apes to a cursed doll, it's all in here. You chuckle and tuck the pamphlet underneath your arm, but little do you know, you're about to experience something more horrifying than any urban legend could ever be. You see, if you paid attention to your Foundation briefings before you left the state of Florida, you would know that any Foundation personnel who encounter tourist brochure pamphlets advertising self-guided paranormal tours in Florida are to bring said pamphlets to the Foundation's attention immediately. Mobile Task Force Lambda-12, nicknamed Pest Control, is primed on demand for incidents related to these brochures. Why? Because they're a part of a phenomenon, categorized by the SCP Foundation as SCP-3640. But what is SCP-3640? Why is something as innocuous and fun as a paranormal travel brochure an object of high interest for the SCP Foundation? Well, you, someone who should have maybe listened to the regional briefing conference back at Site-19 before you left on your vacation, are about to find out. After perusing your booklet and ruminating over the numerous locations at your disposal, you decide to visit one after you get settled into your hotel. After all, you're about to experience a week of family-friendly fun at the House of Mouse. Why not partake in a little horror just to get the blood pumping? A bit of living life on the edge before the scariest thing you have to deal with is a $10 bottle of water and a three-hour waiting line to ride that giant golf ball. You drive all the way out to the location the pamphlet specified, a bridge by the name of Sunshine Skyway, located right outside of Tampa Bay. Visiting the bridge at night might also get you a visit from a mysterious and beautiful hitchhiker woman who stands on the side of the bridge, 
and attempts to flag down cars. If you happen to take her in, she'll begin to weep, growing progressively louder and louder in her screaming and crying until you reach the other side of the bridge. And when the driver turns back to ask her what's wrong, the woman will have vanished without a trace. Sounds like a fun time, right? Maybe you can find her. Heck, maybe she's single and interested in an enthusiastic and kind junior researcher of the SCP Foundation. You would never contain her, you promise having to raise your voice over the sound of her weeping and crying in the back seat of your car. Or maybe not. This vacation time outside of the lab is making you think some strange, strange stuff. Whatever the case is, you want to see a ghost girl. So you make your way over to the Sunshine Skyway at 11 at night, just like the pamphlet specified. The bridge is strangely empty, especially for what's usually a crowded stretch of the road. In fact, now that you realize it, there's no one else here. Just you, your car, the black night sky, and the sound of your humming engine. Well, up the road you go, looking for this supposed ghost hitchhiker. The skyway is quite the drive, and the longer you ride, the less safe you feel. But you're fine, right? It's a very popular bridge driven by thousands of people every day and night. It just so happens to be completely empty at an ordinary time of night, and you can see the dark outline of a figure in the distance, standing in the middle of the road. As you drive closer and closer, you start to make out the figure a bit more. A circular head, a tall, wide body, and two more circles on top of that round ball head. Closer, a little closer, and... Wait, is that...? There's absolutely no way that's who you think it is. Is that a Mickey Mouse costume standing in the middle of the road? It apparently is, and it seems like it's not getting out of the way. You honk your horn, but the overgrown rat doesn't listen. It's still standing there, unmoving. You slow down. You know what Disney's legal team is capable of, and you are absolutely not going to jail for running over Mickey Mouse. So if he's not moving out of the way, you will instead. You try to maneuver around the stationary mascot, but suddenly, out of nowhere, the thing leaps 15 feet into the air and jumps onto your hood. You scream as the Mickey mascot skitters across the roof of your car clawing and tearing at the sunroof trying to get in. You push your foot on the gas as hard as you can, enough force to propel Mickey from the roof, but it's not enough. The mascot hits the ground but immediately gets back up and starts running after your car. Almost instantaneously, it catches up to your car again and uses its strength to pry off the door on the driver's side of the car, exposing you and causing you to lose control of your vehicle. You swerve, crashing into the side of the bridge and banging your head off of the steering wheel. You never thought your life would result in death by Mickey Mouse, but the rapidly approaching costume creature seems to be saying otherwise. The Mickey creature bends down and uses both of its gloved hands to grab you from your car seat with enough force to break the seatbelt and give you minor whiplash from being flung into the air so quickly. This is it. You know it's over. And you don't even know what's going on or why this is happening. You're just another victim of something you don't understand like the countless dead you spent your life researching. Or so you think. Just when you assume that it's all over, a shot rings out from across the bridge, and you see a salvo of bullets pepper Mickey Mouse's back, carefully missing you with impressively accurate precision. Mickey drops you, banging your head on the concrete, and runs towards where the bullets are coming from. Several armored, heavily armed soldiers appear from the side of the bridge and circle the mouse. They fire again, but it has little effect on the mascot. Once again, he lunges forward, knocking a soldier off his feet. The mascot dashes off into the distance, leaping over the side of the bridge. Though no splash is heard in the water below, you don't see the mascot landing, or even escaping. It's like he was never there in the first place. But at least it's gone now, and you have these unknown soldiers to thank you for your- Wait, is that an SCP Foundation logo? Oh no, they're Foundation Task Force operatives. Before you're able to fully regain your senses, you can already hear the task force captain telling his underling to prep you for amnestics and an interview. The soldier approaches you, and you're thankfully able to muster out a few choice words, namely, Wait, 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 I'm with you guys, I'm a junior researcher! The captain pauses and laughs to himself. <laughs> what are the odds? After you're processed and taken to the nearest facility, where your identity as a card-carrying member of the SCP Foundation is confirmed, you let in on what exactly it was you just saw back there. As it turns out, you had an encounter with SCP-3640, an anomaly centering around a set of travel brochures that advertised self-guided tours of all of Florida's paranormal hotspots. 
If someone reads the brochure and goes to a location at a set time, just like you did, they'll be preyed upon by a mysterious, predatory entity or set of entities that resembles costumed mascot characters owned by the Walt Disney Company. Mickey, Donald, Goofy. The task force captain explains that they're all there, and they're all over the state of Florida. Hundreds of mascots, maybe more. They're fast, dangerous, and the Foundation knows remarkably little about them, including how they grow, reproduce, or even consume their prey. All of the known hotspots advertised in the pamphlet are routinely watched by members of the Pest Control Mobile Task Force, where operatives are authorized to neutralize SCP-3640 entities with lethal force, which is how that task force was able to thankfully show up at the right moment and save your life. SCP-3640 only attack those who read the brochures and haven't been seen being hostile or hunting outside of the areas specified by the pamphlet. After you recollect yourself and thank them, the captain hands you a file briefing on SCP-3640, gives you a stern warning, and tells you to familiarize yourself with it before you leave the facility. What a way to start your vacation, you think. Just when you thought you were able to escape the daily horrors of working for the Foundation, you stumble upon an anomaly yourself. But you undoubtedly have more questions about SCP-3640. After all, anyone would after witnessing as weird and strange an anomaly as that in the wild. You ask the captain why the Foundation hasn't captured an SCP-3640 instance, especially if they're so common in the Florida area. He sits down, sighs, and explains that the Foundation did try a while back. It was a standard D-Class test held in the St. John's River, the location of a supposed river monster. The D-Class personnel was dropped off at the riverbank and told to follow the instructions in the pamphlet. If they spotted a mascot, they were to shoot at it with a tranquilizer gun. After dredging through the river for a few minutes and being distracted by a neat-looking alligator, the D-Class eventually came head-to-head -head with none other than Donald Duck himself, who emerged from the river and immediately began moving towards the D-Class. The D-Class naturally freaked out completely and ran away from the scene, but Donald was simply too fast. Just when he thought he was safe, the Donald mascot emerged from the shadows and knocked the camera and radio off of the D-Class's head. There were sounds of a struggle, but the D-Class never established contact again. However, his subdermal tracking transmitters continued to operate, and before they went offline completely, they luckily detected the location of the D-Class's body. It was just outside of the Epcot Amusement Park. Engaged by the captain's story, you ask him what happened next. Surely the Foundation launched an assault on Epcot to figure out what happened to the D-Class, right? The captain grunts and tells you that the rest is classified, but you're not satisfied. You're refusing to move until you figure out what happened to this D-Class. The captain rolls his eyes and, perhaps feeling sorry for you, decides to tell you the rest of the story. Him and his team were deployed just outside of the Epcot theme park, right next to a one-story concrete hut where the D-Class's location was tracked. They were equipped with heavy arms, a net launcher, and a flamethrower, all perfect weapons for subduing these deadly mascots. While Lambda-12 was typically used to hunting anomalous bugs and pests, they figured that hunting down Donald Duck and Minnie Mouse was more or less the same thing, when you squint really hard and pretend that they have wings. The task force broke into the hut, revealing it to be a maintenance shed with a mysterious trapdoor in the middle of the floor. Underneath, a ladder led to a tunnel system, similar to the ones built underneath the Disney parks that the employees used to get around from park to park. The team spotted several dressing rooms and storage rooms, all empty and devoid of life. After some exploration, the team followed a low rumbling noise to a closed door. They slowly opened it, revealing an abandoned boiler room with a white mascot costume at the foot of the boiler, curled up around an unknown object. An operative approached the costume and poked it with a rifle, identifying it as an empty Daisy Duck costume. The team examined it further and found a human arm bone inside the suit. Disgusting, to be sure, but nothing the task force hadn't seen before. They turned over the suit to examine the object it was curled around, discovering it to be a purple plastic egg with an embryo inside. 
Scattered across the floor were more eggshells. The squad gathered them, as well as the bones of the D-Class in the costume, to bring it back to the facility. Suddenly, the task force heard noises in the distance and assumed an attack formation. They noticed the floor of the entrance they came in was now covered in dark fluid and polyester stuffing. The trail of liquid exactly matched their path of infiltration into the tunnel. After determining the situation to be safe, the squad carefully left the tunnel the way they came, bringing the costume and the egg with them. After several weeks, the egg hatched into a miniature stuffed Donald Duck toy. The Foundation dissected it, discovering it to contain a plastic endoskeleton and a rudimentary polyester stuffing muscular system inside. And that was everything the captain had to say. There was never any other leads on the SCP-3640 anomaly, just strangeness and inexplicable inability to capture or understand the mascots. You thank the captain for not only saving you, but explaining what was going on. Before you left the facility to go back to your regular foundationless vacation, you took another glance at the document the captain handed to you. On the back page was a chilling letter, dated from 1979, written to Florida Governor Reuben Askew by the Walt Disney Company. It read as follows. The Walt Disney Company thanks you for your cooperation in this matter regarding the unlicensed Walt Disney character operators. Please pass along the following information collected by the outstanding men and women of the City of Orlando's Police Department to the Florida National Guard. If a character is spotted, call to get its attention and then rapidly flash your flashlights at the costume. If it does not flinch, fire on sight. Aim at the head if possible, else aim at the knees to disable them and then finish them off with headshots. Body shots have been shown to lack effectiveness. Deceased characters are to be incinerated. No other means of disposal are advised. We are currently pursuing alternative legal means of shutting down these unlicensed operators and hope to achieve a settlement within the end of the year. Cordially yours, The Walt Disney Company. October 1988. SCP Foundation agents Cyril Novak and Diana Fisher have been dispatched to Austria's capital city, Vienna, to investigate a series of mysterious, unexplained disappearances. The Foundation was unsure if these events were connected or even anomalous in nature, but they had reason to believe that something was lurking beneath the dark streets of Vienna. A Foundation operative embedded in local law enforcement informed the organization that the authorities were panicking, with an emphasis on withholding information about these disappearances from the public and the media. Novak and Fisher conducted a survey of the city, observing the streets at night and keeping a watchful eye on those who they deemed at risk. It was the undesirables of society that were disappearing in droves. Unsupervised children, vagrants, the homeless, all those that were indisposed, vulnerable, and otherwise at risk of being forgotten by society were potential victims. According to several sources, these disappearances were taking place near access points to the city's subterranean infrastructure, sewer holes, access tunnels, storm drains. Anywhere that led to the underground was a potential risk site. After a few days of standard exploration and information gathering around Vienna, Novak and Fisher moved on to interviews with law enforcement and public officials. Using a variety of cover stories, they managed to pry out a deadly secret from the mouth of the police chief. Human remains had been recovered near the disappearance sites. The authorities opted to keep them a secret from the public so as not to cause any panic of a crazed serial killer on the loose or inspire fears of something even worse lurking in the city's underground. The agents seized the three cadavers and alerted the Foundation that their mission had been progressing as expected. The bodies were transported to Humanoid Containment Site 282 in Graz, Austria, where they were immediately examined by Dr. Felix Gottner, who performed an autopsy on the three corpses. If the Foundation was unsure about anomalous involvement before, they were certain of it now. The bodies were in shambles, mutilated beyond belief and altered into an almost unrecognizable state. The mere stench of them caused personnel working with them to rush to the bathroom, and even those that could typically keep their lunch down had a difficult time examining them. Cadaver A, the cause of death was determined to be from exsanguination, or the extreme loss of blood. Cadaver B was missing some important fleshy components inside and out, some of which had been removed entirely. The cause of death was presumed to be traumatic cardiac arrest. The third corpse, Cadaver C, was barely a body. Instead, it was a collection of bones and fluids. 
The cause of death, because of the opaque conditions the cadaver was found in, was unknown. These grisly deaths were only the start of the Foundation's containment of this anomaly, and are far from the worst this file has to offer. This is SCP Explained, and today we're going to be looking at SCP-3288, a collection of entities otherwise known as the Aristocrats. Dr. Gartner's analysis of the cadavers came to a single conclusion. A human could not do this. In fact, he compared the deceased's injuries and conditions with the bodies of victims of hyena attacks. All sustained injuries weren't the result of a blunt object, sharpened blade, or a firearm, but instead resulted from a combination of teeth, claws, and raw physical strength. The bodies had abnormally large bite marks, approximately six times the size of adult human teeth. Yet closer analysis revealed that the indentations did, in fact, coincide with human teeth. Whatever did this possessed more than 60 teeth, unevenly distributed over six distinct rows, and required jaws much larger than those of ordinary humans. There were unique patterns among these markings, suggesting that it wasn't a single entity that ravaged these corpses, but multiple. There was no doubt about it. These deaths were anomalous in nature. The Foundation issued a designation for the entities responsible, SCP-3288, and deployed Mobile Task Force Sigma-6, Hellsingers, a special unit trained to capture deadly anomalies in the field, to bring SCP-3288 into Foundation custody. The operatives were tasked with patrolling the Leopoldstadt district, the area where most of the disappearances had occurred. Secrecy, as usual, was a top priority, and members of the task force took extra care to conduct their operations away from the public eye. As the purpose of this mission was to contain the entities for further study, the operatives were also ordered to refrain from lethal force and to target SCP-3288 with tracking darts to prevent them from escaping. The task force divided up their assignments. Twelve operatives would patrol the district and search for any suspicious activity, while ten others would remain watch in positions with unrestricted views of sewer holes and other underground access areas. For the first few hours, things were quiet, but then two operatives stationed near the Danube Canal made a report to the rest of the team. Someone near the canal was screaming, not loudly, but in a muffled, faint way. The operatives took initiatives and ran off to investigate the matter themselves, requesting backup at the same time. Reinforcements arrived less than three minutes later, but their teammates could not be found. Moments later, their bodies were discovered by another operative, mangled beyond belief. Both operatives were killed, and alongside them was a half-consumed corpse of a local civilian as well. One operative's body was recovered from the canal, while the other was found after following a trail of blood and fluids into an alleyway. But despite the loss of life, the mission was still deemed a success. Before being mauled by the SCP-3288 instance, the task force operative managed to shoot the entity with a tracking bullet, a piece of technology utilizing satellite location, which allowed the rest of the team to follow the entity into the sewers. The tracking was working perfectly, and the entity was shown to be fleeing into Vienna's sewer system, until the signal faded somewhere near the Hofburg, a palace constructed centuries ago that was once host to the Habsburg dynasty and presently serves as the seat of power for the president of Austria. The team was confused, as the fading nature of the signal suggested that the tracking bullet had been brought into a location far deeper than the Viennese sewers were believed to accommodate. The mission moved onward, into the depths of the sewers, in pursuit of SCP-3288. The following day, the task force had assembled a strategy for mapping and exploring the Viennese sewer system. Constructed in the mid-19th century, these sewers were part of a larger network of subterranean tunnels that include catacombs, abandoned wine cellars, and underground rivers. Without proper planning and clear communication, death could be a very real possibility, and not even one caused by SCP-3288. The task force was divided into four teams of five, three to investigate the sewers and one to remain on standby. By triangulating the location of the tracked instance, the Foundation was able to pinpoint the general area they would need to explore. By blocking off certain exits and surface access points, they hoped to minimize the possibility of the entity's escape or exposure to the public. While the primary objective remained containing an SCP-3288 instance for scientific research, 
lethal force was authorized to be used in case of emergencies. The Foundation valued the lives of its trained soldiers and put them above nearly anything. Still, the authorization of lethal force spelled impending doom for many experienced veterans of the task force. They knew all too well about what kind of entity they were up against when the Foundation opted to skip the containment step and prioritize getting out alive. A team of operatives reached their destination safely, but didn't discover anything of significance during their trek through the sewers of Vienna. At least, not at first. After several hours of investigation, they encountered human skeletal remains while making their way through waist-deep sewage. One member of the task force pointed out a loose brick in the wall, and then another did some minutes later. Inspection of the area found a number of loose-fitting bricks that were able to be removed with ease, as if they were put there to hide something. When the entryway was fully unearthed, it revealed a previously unseen chamber, whose walls were engraved with the House of Habsburg's coat of arms. Operatives inside of the chamber immediately knew what they were looking at, a family crypt of royal bloodline never uncovered before. The forgotten atmosphere made them feel like they were discovering a secret that they were never supposed to know. Twenty-four sarcophagi were found within the chamber, and historical records of the sewers and surrounding area mention nothing about a crypt beneath the palace. Multiple statues were recovered from the chamber as well, depicting veiled women with hushed expressions, holding a finger to their lips. Almost as if to say that this place was a royal secret, and trespassing had grave consequences. Get it? Grave? Consequences? No? <sighs> okay, moving on. Thought I would be funny today. The tombs themselves were intricate, decorated with ornate jewelry and various expensive embellishments, but did not include placards, markings, or any indication as to who was entombed within. When the operatives opened the sarcophagi, they were disgusted. The skeletal remains of over 300 bodies all displaying severe and likely fatal birth deformities. The team was at a loss. What was the meaning of this room? The entrance had been destroyed some time ago, with stairs shattered and buried among the stone. Near the other side of the row of tombs was a vault door, coated in bronze and bearing the coat of arms of the Habsburgs. A seal written in Latin was engraved beneath the coat. Translated, it read, for purity of blood. The task force tried to pry the door open, but it wouldn't budge. Opening it would require special equipment, and after what they had witnessed inside the sarcophagus, some members of the team were even hesitant to continue trying. The team was ordered by the supervising team to hold their location and await the arrival of another team that would open the door. Foundation agents on the surface organized a temporary evacuation of the Hofburg building. The team waited for backup throughout the night. They made attempts to open the vault, but to no avail. Once the surface had been properly evacuated, and an infiltration team arrived inside the chamber to assist with the vault door, the gate was able to be opened using oxygen fuel cutting torches over a period of two hours. Once opened, the team was met with an ominous descending staircase, leading to an unknown dark location underneath the palace. An eight-man squad, heavily armed and equipped with recording devices, ventured down the staircase. Radio transmissions from the squad grew increasingly faint over time. When they reached the estimated 65-meter mark underground, their communications arrays were barely audible. At the bottom of the stairwell was an ornate foyer. Instead of decaying gray stone walls and oceans of sewage, there were marble floors with felted carpets and white painted walls and ceilings. This chamber was found to be architecturally identical to a certain wing of the Hofburg Palace. Furthermore, the chamber was clearly built in the 18th century, as many aesthetic choices popular during that era were clearly present. Much like the crypt, there were sculptures and statues, but this time there were also columns, paintings, and tattered tapestries. Some of the operatives admiring the beauty of the room overlooked that on every piece of art, any and all depictions of the human form were defaced and altered. The air was rancid, with operatives describing the odor as similar to rotten meat and stale sweat. The floor and walls were discolored with what appeared to be dried old blood. Regardless, they moved forward. In between the space equivalent of the Hofburg Imperial Library was a laboratory, not found in the palace above. An operative collected numerous documents relating to alchemy, biology, and the occult, as well as a journal of transactions, contracts, and private writings. These documents were delivered to above personnel and were later translated by Foundation personnel. All along the chamber were human remains, decomposing and strewn around the palace. Suddenly, a bell tolled. 
and the music of a pipe organ began playing discordantly for over three minutes. Operatives hid themselves and deactivated their flashlights, some hiding behind the curtains of a large opera hall and others behind large instruments. They heard footsteps in the distance. Minutes later, a group of figures emerged into the palace hall. These entities the Foundation had classified as SCP-3288 were now fully visible. Their outfits were typical of the 18th century, containing deep shades of red that contrasted with their stark white skin, porcelain masquerade masks, and powdered wigs. Their bodies were monstrous, with arms dragging across the floor, uneven faces, long fingers, some possessing more than ten of, and hunched backs. A pair of smaller instances entered behind the horde of others, and one blew a rusted trumpet, while the other held a banner depicting the Habsburg crest. The trumpeteer began speaking, but its words were unintelligible and raw, guttural moans. They ran out of the way, their stunted legs causing them to trip across the floor. There were now over several hundred SCP-3288 instances inside the ballroom. Multiple operatives activated silent distress calls, requesting backup to deal with the massive entities they would have to contain. These instances bowed their heads, and another mass of footsteps were heard as a group of SCP-3288 instances carried a morbidly obese instance atop a throne. It wore a cape, a red veil in place of a mask, and a crown too small for its head. It was evident that this was their leader. A large cauldron was placed before the king. A small instance climbed atop the king's shoulder and lifted the entity's veil to speak to it. The cauldron was uncovered, and the king lurched forward, grabbing the tub and pouring its contents down its massive mouth. Some of the king's disgusting meals spilled from its mouth, revealing a small human child with severe deformities. The SCP-3288 instances roared in applause and began to feast, all while the cacophony of noise brought on by the various instruments inside the ballroom raged on. An operative hiding behind a harpsichord was discovered by an SCP-3288 instance and quickly consumed by it, in the feeding frenzy the entities were engaged in. Still barely alive before being entirely digested by the entity, the consumed task force operative triggered an explosive device from within the entity's stomach. With a look of immediate discomfort, the entity suddenly exploded, taking out several other nearby 3288 instances with a blast. The entities were distraught, and while they were distracted, the task force leapt into action and rendered the remaining SCP-3288 instances not killed by the explosion unconscious using devices loaded with a gas. As Foundation reinforcements arrived, the surviving SCP-3288 entities were contained and moved to Site-282, including the massive king, whose body was transported using a specialized crane. After the removal of all remaining entities, the palace was filled with cement and reburied, with the Foundation making sure that no one would ever discover it again. After the king was contained, Foundation personnel were shocked to discover that the entity could speak. In an interview with the hulking monstrosity, it revealed that its name was Maximilian the Great, a patriarch of the House Habsburg. The entity's eyesight was severely damaged from centuries of living underground, and the Foundation was able to get the king to comply by shining powerful lights in its eyes. The entity was delusional, believing itself still to be inside the palace and referring to the doctor as nothing more than mere meat, which it wanted to consume. When the doctor was able to convince the king that he too was noble blood, which the king believed due to his unstable mental state, the entity uttered a chilling statement. We are of this same noble blood, but some are more noble than others. Our bloodline is pure untainted by outsiders. We do not eat human. We eat peasants. We eat undesirables. We devour life undeserving of life. That is the nature of nobility. What else would be the point? DNA testing revealed that the king was, in fact, descended from the House of Habsburgs, as all SCP-3288 instances were. But what of the journal entries discovered inside the palace? After translation, the Foundation found that they contained the writings of Leopold I, a Holy Roman Emperor and member of the Habsburg House in the early 1700s. His writings detailed his desire to claim power over the royal family, 
as well as his fears of an increased number of inbred, deformed members of the Habsburg house. Leopold details meeting a woman of unknown origin, who promised him that his family name could live forever. She taught him arcane knowledge involving experimentations of the flesh. Small animals, and eventually humans, were subject to Leopold's disgusting, unholy experiments. Even his mystical teacher became disgusted with what her tutelage had wrought. As payment, she demanded that Leopold cease his reign, deliver his land and wealth to common people, and destroy his various deeds and titles. Leopold refused, and had the woman burned at the stake for witchcraft. Eventually, Leopold's experiments to make his bloodline perpetual resulted in the creation of SCP-3288. Years of inclusive family ties mutated over one another, generation after generation, until a horde of SCP-3288 living underneath the palace and feasting on a diet of human meat were created. For years, the surface Habsburgs catered to SCP-3288's depraved and disgusting needs, providing them with a slew of humans to feast on, and a lavish lifestyle akin to the one lived by the nobility above. One other document revealed to the Foundation that there were multiple hives of SCP-3288 existing throughout Europe. Most were discovered and neutralized, but the original writing was heavily damaged by mold, meaning that there were some locations the Foundation was unable to uncover. Colonies of SCP-3288 instances buried underground, snatching humans without any care, mutating their own deformities, and living horribly, unable to be stopped. A captured SCP-3288 instance in Germany revealed that there was another entity, similar to the king in authority, by the name of the Empress. It had this to say to the Foundation upon being contained. The meek will beget the strong. The doomed will beget the chosen. Don't you see? The greedy will devour the charitable, and the merciless will ravage the peaceful. We will make the world as perfect as us. We will all be aristocrats in the end, and our dynasty will never die. It was July of 2004 and Bill Murray was enjoying the peak of an extremely successful career. Not only had the iconic actor starred in some of the most beloved comedies of the 20th century, including Ghostbusters and Groundhog Day, he'd voiced the main character of the recently released live-action Garfield movie. It'd been a financial success, but it was a critical flop. Not that this bothered Bill. He was happy with the performance. And the paycheck. What he wouldn't be quite as happy about was the horrifying encounter he was about to have with SCP-3166. On July 8th, Bill was enjoying a cold drink on the porch of his luxurious Beverly Hills home. The sky was beginning to darken as the sun set in the west. It was a blissful evening. His wife Jennifer was inside, watching TV. Nothing seemed particularly out of the ordinary until he noticed a quick flash of orange in the distance. It was almost too fast to register, this large orange shape darting past the corner of his eye. For a second, he entertained the thought that it might have been an escaped tiger, but it was gone too fast to really tell. Bill finished his drink and headed inside. He had enough for one night. The next morning, he got up to read the paper and found the Garfield movie getting slaughtered by the critics. One review stated, No one can accuse Garfield the movie of infidelity to its source. It faithfully conveys the banality of Jim Davis's cartoon. Another called it, a film without energy and without spirit. He put the paper down and ate his breakfast. A few blows to the ego were worth it for the paydays that came with big budget family films. Just then, his wife came to him with a strange question. Were you walking around downstairs in the middle of the night? No, he hadn't. He'd been sleeping like a baby. Why did she ask? Well, Jennifer said, I heard some rustling downstairs last night. It sounded like something big. He hadn't heard anything though, and told her it was probably just her imagination. He put it out of his mind and continued about his day. He decided he would keep his eyes peeled for that orange blur again though. Bill didn't see anything peculiar the rest of the morning and went to a local cafe for lunch. He ordered a coffee and a cream cheese bagel, then made a quick trip to the bathroom while his food was prepared. When Bill returned to his table though, there was something strange. Instead of a bagel, there was a large heaping of lasagna on the table. What was going on? This cafe didn't even serve lasagna. Bill knew something was terribly wrong. 
Things only got stranger when Bill came home to find a small tuft of orange fur snagged on the frame of his front door. And it wasn't synthetic fur like you'd see on plush toys or stuffed animals. No, this was real animal fur. Maybe someone was just goofing off or trying to play some weird prank on him. But it didn't feel like it. Deep down, Bill Murray knew that he was in grave danger. Whoever, or whatever, was behind this. It wanted to hurt him. That night, his worst fears were realized. Bill's wife had left town for the week, and he was headed to the kitchen in the middle of the night for a glass of water, when he saw something. A huge figure moving up against the glass door leading to his backyard. The thing was huge, nearly seven feet tall, with a bloated, fur-covered, misshapen body that was pressed up against the door. Its fur was bright, garish orange, a cartoon orange. Strangest of all, though, was the sound it was making. It sounded like it was purring. Bill backed away from the door and then ran back to his room to hide. The whole night he sat cowering as he heard scratching against the walls, like something was trying to get in. He was terrified and too scared to do anything, even move. Finally, as morning broke, the noises seemed to stop. Bill had to do something. He couldn't let this nightmare go on another night. What if things got worse? What if that thing managed to get inside? He called the local police and when they arrived, he explained the incredibly strange situation as best he could. He told them he was being stalked by some kind of huge cat, or at least someone dressed like a huge cat. Also, there was lasagna involved. The officers interviewing him could barely contain their laughter as he told them his story. A giant orange cat? Perhaps one of them theorized. He angered some kind of obsessive Garfield fan through his involvement in the live-action movie. After all, the original comic had been running for years and had been extremely popular. Who knows what kind of nutjobs were obsessed with seeing only a faithful adaptation of the source material. As the officers departed, Bill was confident that they weren't taking him seriously. He couldn't rely on any of them for protection. Thankfully, from a multi-decade movie career, he had plenty of disposable income and decided to hire a private security team to protect him while he looked into this mystery. He had two trained bodyguards positioned around his home at all times for the next month. They were armed and given the cryptic orders to fire on anything orange. Meanwhile, Bill began to fall down a Garfield rabbit hole. He felt strangely compelled to research all the Garfield media he could find, as though the answer to his terrifying situation was somehow hidden between the lines. Bill explored the entire backlog of thousands of comic strips. He read the books and interviews with Jim Davis. He watched the cartoons and straight-to-DVD animated movies. Ironically, for a guy who'd recently portrayed the lasagna-loving orange cat, Bill had never felt quite so immersed in the character before. He found the strange pathos in the routine of Garfield and his friends. One particular comic really piqued his interest, though. Originally published in October of 1989, the comic began with Garfield being woken up by a strange chill, an almost eerie sensation. The character observed aloud that he didn't feel like he was in his own home. He explored his little home further, trying to find his owner John or his housemaid and sometimes nemesis, Odie, but found nothing. As Garfield remarked on feeling alone, a purple speech box delivered the sinister message. You have no idea how alone you are, Garfield. He then finds that his home looks like it's been abandoned for years. The for sale sign outside is practically ancient. Garfield slowly comes to a horrifying revelation. Everyone really is gone, and his adventures and friends now exist only in his imagination. He's trapped in a prison of his own creation, trying to stave off his endless loneliness in denial about the reality of his situation. The comic ended with a quote directly from Jim Davis himself saying, an imagination is a powerful tool. It can tint memories of the past, shade perceptions of the present, or paint a future so vivid that it can entice or terrify, all depending upon how we conduct ourselves today. As he read those words, hmm. Bill Murray felt a chill down his spine. Why had he wanted to get involved in the Garfield movie in the first place? What had he gotten himself into? Before he could slip any deeper into his own mind, Bill heard a faint, choked scream downstairs. He felt his breath catch in his throat. He was terrified, but needed to see what was happening. He carefully and quietly began to creep down the stairs. 
At the bottom, he poked his head around a corner, and that's when he saw a member of his security detail lying dead on the floor. His face was blue from asphyxiation. His mouth was stuffed with lasagna. It looked like he had been force-fed to death. Bill wanted to scream, but he couldn't, or maybe knew he shouldn't. Just then, he heard a soft, meaty thumping noise coming from the nearby living room. He didn't know why, but he felt compelled to approach, as if by forces beyond his control. He made his way to the living room, and when he'd got there, he saw where the noise was coming from. Bill's jaw dropped in pure horror. There was the other member of his security detail, lying limp and lifeless under a giant orange figure. It was a grotesquely huge creature, wearing what looked to be a kind of crude Garfield outfit made of sewn-together cat pelts. It stank of pasta and rotten meat. In its giant paw, it held a golden trophy, which it was using to pound the security guard's head into mush, while making quiet, cat-like purring noises. The creature suddenly stopped and looked up, locking eyes with Bill. The fear of death came over him. He froze as the giant, freakish Garfield stepped over Donnie's corpse and began to come towards him. Bill turned and ran, but Garfield was gaining on him. Before he could make it to the front door, the creature knocked him over. He was laid out on the ground, looking up at it as it reached into its own body cavity and began to pull out handfuls of lasagna. He was about to shove a wad of the horrible, decaying pasta into Bill's mouth when suddenly a ding was heard and the creature stopped. It looked up as if sniffing the air, and then suddenly turned and lumbered towards the kitchen. Bill watched as the Garfield monster entered the kitchen where, somehow, there was a steaming hot fresh lasagna sitting in the open oven. The creature had sensed the presence of external lasagna and felt the compulsion to integrate it into its body, grabbing fistfuls and shoving it into itself. Just then, a group of highly trained SCP Foundation personnel burst into the room and subdued the creature. It had been an ambush. The Foundation had been tipped off to the presence of the creature by monitoring the local police department dispatches, and the report of a seven-foot-tall comic book cat terrorizing a Hollywood actor was definitely worth looking into. The monster that had almost taken Bill Murray's life was SCP-3166, a deadly pataphysical being that tends to manifest around people somehow involved in the Garfield intellectual property. It appears whenever the public perception of Garfield falls out of favor, and because Bill had starred in the critically panned Garfield movie, he was currently at the very top of SCP-3166's hit list. Thankfully, he managed to survive his terrifying ordeal, and was administered amnestics by Foundation personnel so that he could return to his normal life. This frightening and mysterious creature has been around since 1989, appearing after the publication of the haunting Garfield comic that Bill had read that very night. It appeared in the office of United Media, who were the publishers of the Garfield comic strip at the time, and began wrecking havoc. Since then, the creature's manifestation has been a constant threat whenever Garfield loses its popularity or audience. As a result, the Foundation has spent years as the funding source behind all Garfield media, and even planting hypnotic mimetics into the comic strips to ensure that there is always a loyal fan base. The fur is indeed real organic cat fur, albeit an unnaturally orange color, and instead of organs, the creature is filled with lasagna. Worst of all, though, is that testing has revealed that the meat in the lasagna is genetically identical to the flesh of Garfield's creator, Jim Davis. How did this thing come into existence? Perhaps it was Jim's sheer force of imagination that dragged it into being. As he himself said, an imagination is a powerful tool. All in all, it's lucky that Bill Murray was able to survive his encounter and return to his normal life. Well, as normal as life can be for Bill Murray. And if you see Bill Murray, don't bother asking him about SCP-3166. The amnestics were quite effective, and just as he's fond of saying himself, no one will ever believe you. An SCP Foundation researcher sits at a table inside of a standard containment cell. These are often dangerous places to be, especially when the SCP you're supposed to be studying is one that you can't see. The researcher is taking notes, unsure of exactly what is going to happen next. He can hear the sounds of knives scraping behind, of flesh sizzling and searing from high heat. 
He braces himself as a burst of heat hits the back of his head, as if a fireball has erupted. An object floats through the air and settles in front of him on the table. It's a plate of food, and it looks delicious. It may surprise you to learn that there is no rule that the SCP Foundation must deal exclusively with violent and vicious creatures. Not every SCP held in containment shares the same malevolence and contempt for humanity as SCP-682, or the world-ending threat posed by the likes of SCP-2317. Some, perhaps not many, but some, are benign and might even seem outwardly friendly, but you'd still be taking a huge risk to assume that anything contained by the SCP Foundation is completely harmless. Such is the case with SCP-5031. As per the Foundation's containment procedures, this quasi-humanoid, meaning it appears to have some vaguely human features, is held in an airtight cell that is regularly checked by Foundation personnel on a bi-weekly basis. SCP-5031 has no need for regular nutrition or regular interactions from staff. The trick with SCP-5031 is not being eaten by it, since though it doesn't need food, it does still hunt and consume anything it encounters, human or otherwise. Avoiding being eaten is hard enough with creatures that can actually be seen, but like so many other creatures the Foundation keeps contained, SCP-5031 has developed an almost perfect defense mechanism, which is when observed, it will literally cease to exist. Some might choose to refer to this as a quantum lock, however it is worth noting that traces left by SCP-5031 still remain observable when the creature has temporarily disappeared. For example, trails of blood and scratch marks left behind by SCP-5031 still exist when the SCP itself does not. Naturally, this makes both avoiding the creature and capturing it using cameras difficult. However, when SCP-5031's existence ceases, it still casts a shadow. From this, researchers have been able to determine several of the creature's physical traits. Based on its silhouette, it has been deduced that SCP-5031 levitates about half a meter above ground level, sports an abnormally small necklace head atop an elongated torso, approximately 1.9 meters long, with three sets of spindly lower arms that branch outwards. Using these arms and its loosely hanging body, SCP-5031 will lower itself to hunt any human or animal that draws near to it, and uses the blade-like tail to cut up food. Perhaps the most interesting facet of SCP-5031 beyond its defensive capabilities and apparent physical attributes are the series of nine tests conducted by senior researcher Stanley Huxtable. Appalled by the conditions that the creature was being kept in, Huxtable took over the role of HCL supervisor for SCP-5031. Having grown increasingly frustrated and empathetic towards the creature, listening to its screams from inside its iron containment unit, Huxtable devised a series of tests to introduce SCP-5031 to various different stimuli as a way to better understand the creature, and hopefully keep it contained in a way that didn't seem to cause so much suffering. It's worth remembering that the SCP Foundation makes its mission to be cold, not cruel, in performing their duties to protect normality, and many of the researchers and staff are just as capable of having empathy for creatures as you might for a stray animal at a shelter. The first of Huxtable's tests involved installing speakers in SCP-5031 cell, through which a variety of different ambient and popular pieces of music were played to see if they had any effect on reducing the creature's stress. By judging SCP-5031 stress levels based on how much it screamed when compared to normal, Huxtable was able to determine how to best use music to calm the creature. SCP-5031 seemed to convey higher levels of stress when listening to Morning Forest, Deep Grotto, and Seaside Paradise ambience, as well as the best of late 60s British rock band Jethro Tull. However, the best of Mozart, Enya, Kiss, and Ben Folds produced dramatically different results, decreasing SCP-5031's apparent stress. Following this test, senior researcher Huxtable compiled a playlist featuring SCP-5031's favorite music. Over time, the stress-reducing effects of music on SCP-5031 seemed to decrease, but keeping the playlist on shuffles seemed to keep the creature consistently calmer than it had been previously. The next test involved introducing inanimate objects into SCP-5031's enclosure to monitor its reactions and how its stress levels were affected. When a softball was thrown into the enclosure, 
SCP-5031 immediately sliced the ball in two with its tail in one swift motion. A similar result occurred when researchers threw the creature a basketball, which was quickly punctured and sliced open by SCP-5031's tail. Its stress levels first seemed to diminish when the creature was offered a bowling ball, which it rolled around the enclosure and then later knocked it against a second bowling ball. However, when one of the balls chipped, rendering it unable to roll properly, SCP-5031 stress increased dramatically until a replacement was offered. Researcher Huxtable noted that SCP-5031 seemed to possess a similar level of motor skills to an average human toddler, with similarly explosive emotional reactions to match. <laughs> Next, when given the choice between two food sources at opposite ends of its enclosure, SCP-5031 seemed to gravitate towards higher quality food, most notably favored cooked rotisserie chickens over animal carcasses. It even chose this option over a live chicken, using its tail to cut its food into more manageable bite-sized portions, rather than ripping its meat with its hands or teeth like many of its fellow SCPs. Researcher Huxtable recorded these findings and highlighted that, even though SCP-5031 didn't need to eat in order to survive, providing the creature with food of a better quality marginally reduced its stress. Senior researcher Huxtable next attempted to test SCP-5031's coexistence with other living subjects, each time making sure that the creature had been adequately fed to avoid any unseemly incidents. First, a live chicken was introduced. SCP-5031 rolled its bowling ball at high speed towards the chicken, increasing both its and the chicken's stress levels, and inadvertently killing the chicken in the process. When a second chicken was introduced, SCP-5031 gently rolled a basketball towards it, but ceased any further engagement after the chicken squawked from being hit by the ball. Next to be introduced into the enclosure was a blindfolded D-Class staff member, who was instructed to sit down and roll the basketball towards SCP-5031. After doing so for several minutes, the creature began to approach the D-Class subject, who was instructed to remove their blindfold to cease the creature's existence and prevent any potentially deadly incidents. Finally, researcher Huxtable had another Class D engage in a game of catch with SCP-5031 while facing away from the creature. This test proceeded successfully, and senior researcher Huxtable remarked how SCP-5031's motor skills were improving, albeit gradually and with some gentle encouragement. Through Huxtable's tests, the creature was learning. The next test, focused on teaching SCP-5031 linguistic symbols, utilized LCD displays and buttons connected to a food dispenser. One display showed an image of a rock, and the other an image of a rotisserie chicken. After some brief probing, SCP-5031 was quickly able to understand that pressing the button under the correct display would dispense a rotisserie chicken for it to eat. The creature was later able to adapt when, the following day, the screen displays and materials dispensed were swapped and then later set to swap at random intervals. When additional rock dispensing stations were introduced, this time displaying the word rock as opposed to an image, SCP-5031 was able to determine which station dispensed chicken through a process of elimination. Whenever the functions and displays were swapped, SCP-5031 would find whichever displayed the word chicken to receive its food. The final phase of this test presented SCP-5031 with a single station, displaying the word chicken but with a button that would remain inactive unless the creature spelled out the same word with a collection of lettered blocks it was provided with. After some initial confusion and frustrations as to why the button would not dispense food when pressed, SCP-5031 was able to assemble the word correctly, not only activating the button and dispensing food, but proving to researcher Huxtable that the creature was capable of learning language. Huxtable continued to test the creature, encouraging it to spell words using lettered blocks as a method of communicating. By increasing SCP-5031's vocabulary and the amount of human interaction it received, senior researcher Huxtable observed that SCP-5031 was gradually learning to sing, albeit non-verbally, as well as to juggle with its six hands and was even communicating its food preferences and dish pairings. Later, another Class D, D-52125, was introduced to SCP-5031's enclosure to aid in further testing. Through D-52125's instructions, the creature quickly learned to draw using crayons and created artworks depicting itself, its newfound friend D-52125, researcher Huxtable, a cat, and a rotisserie chicken. 
SCP-5031's new creative side didn't stop there, though, as the creature quickly learned to play chopsticks in only two days once a piano was introduced into the enclosure. SCP-5031 even managed to start creating its own original, admittedly crude, compositions. Next, a spice rack was placed inside the creature's cell, and D-52125 demonstrated how to season meat. This proved to be SCP-5031's new favorite hobby, as it spent the next three days experimenting with different combinations of foods and spices, using its letter blocks to request more, more, more garlic powder. Interestingly, the creature only created artwork or music when D-52125 was present, but seemed to thoroughly enjoy its experimentation with food when left alone. Following this development, senior researcher Huxtable devised a new test for SCP-5031, providing the creature with cooking utensils and using D-52125 to demonstrate. 5031 was shown how to prepare a variety of different dishes, from hamburgers and tacos to Mongolian beef, steak, clam chowder, and profiteroles. In addition to a small peanut allergy, this eighth test revealed SCP-5031 to be a phenomenal chef, possessing culinary skills far beyond the average person. The creature quickly and enthusiastically embraced its newfound talents, concocting its very own brand new recipes, with D-52125 even volunteering to be the first to taste test 5031's dishes. It was shortly after this test that SCP-5031 spoke its very first word. And it should come as no surprise that the word was salt. Naturally, senior researcher Huxtable was very proud of the progress the creature had made with its development. The final test almost seemed to be what the creature was born for. Over the course of two months, SCP-5031 was tasked with creating a full three-course meal, which would then be served to Foundation staff for Thanksgiving. SCP-5031 not only rose to the task, but exceeded all of researcher Huxtable's expectations, creating a meal that even Gordon Ramsay would be hard-pressed to find fault with. The creature created a first course consisting of sweet potato miso soup seasoned with turmeric, Next came a beautiful duck confit, glazed luxuriously with apple cider, and topped generously with sweet cranberry compote, paired with a side of butternut squash gnocchi and served on a bed of kale seasoned with truffle salt. The grand finale of the exquisite meal was a spiced cassava pie for dessert, complemented with the finest French vanilla ice cream and a maple hazelnut syrup. And SCP-5031 didn't stop there. The creature also debuted one of its original musical compositions to complement the decadent meal it had created. As the staff enjoyed the food, SCP-5031 performed live from its enclosure the deeply moving Piano Concerto for Six Hands to an overwhelmingly positive response from not only senior researcher Huxtable, but the entire Foundation staff. As a fitting end to the creature's tale, Huxtable reported that, during the Thanksgiving banquet it had created, SCP-5031's stress levels reduced entirely. New kinder containment measures that would keep 5031 safer but also far more contented were submitted for approval. Perhaps some of you may find it refreshing to learn that SCP-5031 isn't simply just another malicious, malevolent monster that the Foundation has to keep under lock and key for the safety of the world. Instead, SCP-5031 is a gentle, if a little frightening at first, creature that just requires careful and considered guidance instead of a cold iron cage and around-the-clock armed guards. Through testing, senior researcher Stanley Huxtable and his fellow Foundation staff were not only able to help the creature develop, but also found what makes it tick, and not just for the purposes of containing it. Instead, it is hoped that SCP-5031's creativity and flair for culinary and musical masterpieces can continue to thrive and grow. Under the proud watch of researcher Huxtable, you hear their footsteps coming down the halls. Or are those your own? Can you even tell the difference? You can tell they're getting closer and you can feel the hate, the rage. You turn, shaking, and finally see them standing right in front of you. But in that moment, you might as well be looking into a mirror. And who knows? Perhaps you are. You just don't seem to remember having so many reflections. Have you ever heard the saying, you are your own worst enemy? Of course, it isn't usually meant literally. But what if it was? What if you had to fight a monster that was you? 
All of your flaws are reflected back at you. Your strengths, your weaknesses, your deepest fears with no way to escape except a battle to the death. Either way, you're not making it out alive. It's just a matter of which version of you survives. But this isn't a thought experiment. No, according to the findings of the SCP Foundation, it's very much a reality. There is a place where this nightmare comes to life, and it's known as SCP-1919. SCP-1919 is a hotel and converted mansion built in the early 20th century. From the outside, it looks pretty much like it did when it was first built, and it almost looks like a comfortable place to stay, if you ignore the eastern side of the building that has sunk partially into the ground. The inside, however, is a different story where it's clear the ravages of time have taken their toll. The floorboards and ceilings are rotting, collapsing in on themselves, and the rooms are filled with debris. It's deadly enough to explore the hotel for these reasons alone, but this is only the beginning of the danger for a person inside. In order to determine just how dangerous it is for either one person or group to enter the structure, the SCP Foundation planned a series of research expeditions into the abandoned building, led by Foundation scientist Dr. Lemkowitz. The first expedition seemed relatively normal, at least it did at the start. A 39-year-old Caucasian D-Class male, known as D-7, was sent into the structure with a camera and a communication system, guided remotely by Dr. Lemkowitz, or Dr. L, and another operative, a former head of the MTF Tau-11 Youth Hostiles who is referred to in this file only as T-11. When he arrived at the building, D-7 was unable to get inside through the front door or windows. After several minutes of trial and error, he was finally able to get in through the western entrance. Dr. L picked up a strange, high-pitched whistling noise upon D-7's entrance into the building, but it quickly faded away and was disregarded by T-11. D-7 discovered a torn painting, a portrait of a young woman with red hair. Next to the portrait, Shallow scratches could be seen in the wall, the floor, and parts of the ceiling. Suddenly, D7 ducked into a hiding place alarmed. He and the other two operatives listening to his audio feed could hear heavy breathing, and it didn't belong to D7. Dr. L recommended that D7 evacuate the building at this sign of another entity inside, but T11 overruled ordering him to disregard that instruction and continue his investigation. D7 was told to stay at a safe distance from whatever was inside with him, and attempt to capture it on video. D7 turned off his flashlight in order to better hide, but T11 commanded that he turn it back on. Whatever was caught in the beam of light was difficult for the camera to see, but it threw D7 into a panic, and he began to run in the opposite direction. When prompted to explain what he saw, D7 simply said, it was me. D7 ran through the dark, panting with fear and exertion. Unable to see where his feet were landing, he tripped over something and came crashing onto the ground, dropping the video camera. This allowed the observing officers to finally see what D7 was so frightened by, and it became clear just why D7 was so terrified. A man, identical looking to D7, approached from the end of the hallway making its way towards the real D7. It was followed by another man who also resembled D7 and another, all running toward the original. They all looked exactly like him, with a few notable differences. They were dressed in the same uniform, with the same build and the same features, but each had something slightly off about him. One was missing eyelids, another had malformed hands, and the third had its lips fused together into a fleshy mass beneath its nose. Dr. L moved to cut the camera feed, but T11 demanded that it be kept running. D7 couldn't be seen by the camera, but the microphone picked up the sounds of flesh and cloth being torn, along with pained, panicked screams as the duplicates set upon him. After a moment, the screaming stopped. Two hours later, the camera was broken, and the expedition brought to a troubling end. This was the Foundation's first glimpse at the creatures inside of SCP-1919, and it was not pretty. It did, however, allow them to begin understanding the nature of the building and what happens when a person goes inside. It appears that when a human enters the hotel, several humanoid creatures manifest throughout the building. These creatures look like the subject and are equipped with the same clothing or items that the subject brought inside with them. Though they are nearly mirror images of the subject, they are always slightly warped in a variety of ways. 
These have included changes to limb and digit length, joint mobility, sealed nostrils, lengthened jaws hanging loose and limp, missing eyelids, and lips that are fused together. These creatures are highly aggressive towards the structure of the building itself, as well as to the subject that they resemble. They do not, however, attack each other. They appear to operate with a hive mind, exhibiting swarm intelligence like that of an ant colony. Once they have been spawned by the entrance of a new person, they will not stop until said person either escapes the building or is killed. After the unfortunate end to the expedition, the Foundation prepped for a second trip inside. This time, three men were sent in with Dr. L's guidance, known as D3, D4, and D9. Video cameras were sewn into their clothes to leave their hands free and help avoid some of the issues that came up during the first expedition. This small team was sent in with the orders to terminate the remaining copies of D7 and further examine the hotel's interior. Upon opening the door to the building, they were immediately attacked by one of D7's copies, which D9 was able to quickly dispatch by firing his weapon at its head. Next, after a great deal of reluctance, the three men entered the building where they spotted something unusual inside. Dr. L was horrified when the camera feed revealed 17 discarded video cameras spread across the floor. They didn't have much time to react to this new discovery, however, because two doubles, one mirroring D7 and another mirroring D9, emerged from the wall and began to attack. Dr. L ordered the team to take shelter, then called the team of guards outside of the hotel's perimeter. They were ordered to begin an immediate full perimeter lockdown, preventing the doubles from leaving the hotel. D3, D4, and D9 attempted to make their way to a safe corner of the building, but found themselves met with a murderous double at every turn. At this point, Dr. L began to hear an unusual sound over the microphone feed, a high-pitched whine like that of a dentist drill. The operatives on the ground couldn't hear a thing, but on Dr. L's end, it was deafening. As the team proceeded deeper into the hotel, they became overcome with a strange feeling of foreboding. Dr. L ordered them to turn on their flashlights, but they refused and begged Dr. L to keep quiet. When prompted to explain, D9 said, She can hear you. The operatives stopped responding, but their camera feeds caught a faint glowing white light coming from beneath a door. The door opened, and the light flooded the camera, making the images it captured hard to decipher. Just a few frames of a quick-moving female silhouette were captured before the cameras cut to static. The bodies of D3, D4, and D9 were never recovered, nor were their cameras. A third expedition was also sent into SCP-1919, but very little is known about what occurred during it. The video transcript is highly classified, and only those present for its events or approved to research SCP-1919 have access to it. An update to the SCP-1919 file following Expedition 3, though, indicates that new information was revealed about the hotel during the excursion. According to the file update, there is some kind of being at the center of the location, which is causing all of the other creatures, the doubles, to appear. The only information available about this being is the use of the word her in the official foundation log about SCP-1919. This seems to match up with the last moments of the operatives in Expedition 2, when they told Dr. L that she can hear you, and the few frames of a female figure that were captured by their cameras. Nothing else is known that has been made available to anyone outside a very select few. Only the original report exists, and all other copies of it have been destroyed. The Foundation has undertaken special containment procedures to make sure that none of the entities from inside the hotel escape, whether they are the evil twins spawned by humans entering the building, or the mysterious female being at the center of the entire disturbing phenomenon. The Foundation has classified SCP-1919 as Euclid, and a two-kilometer radius must be maintained around SCP-1919, with all roads leading to the building are blocked or diverted so that no vehicles are able to reach it. This perimeter is guarded by a set of at least 40 armed and armored guards at any given time, as it has been determined that the doubles spawned by 1919 are equipped with whatever the human they are copying has. No one is allowed to enter the hotel with body armor or weapons of any kind. Anyone that approaches the perimeter that is not a part of an official expedition team will be immediately terminated. 
No new expedition teams are allowed to enter the building unless all doubles from the previous expedition have been exterminated. In the event that they cannot be exterminated, enough time must elapse between expeditions that the previous doubles have starved to death. Though they do not seem to feel hunger, the doubles do need to eat to survive, and will die when left alone for long enough. SCP-1919 has been sealed off from the rest of the world so that no hapless civilians can wander inside and find themselves torn to pieces by warped images of themselves. But that comfort turns cold when you realize that the SCP Foundation still does not understand what causes these doubles to spawn. Is it scientific, supernatural, or something else? No one can be certain. Even more inexplicable is the entity at the center of all of this. An unknown female presence capable of wrecking frightening amounts of violence by turning victims' own images against them. What is the purpose of these funhouse mirror nightmares? Who is she? What is she? And what does she want? Currently, the doubles have shown no interest in leaving the hotel except to attack intruders. And thanks to that fact, as well as the reinforced perimeter outside, these copycats have not appeared outside of the building itself. But what happens if they do escape? or if the entity that controls them decides to make her home elsewhere. There is no telling what could happen if this dark power is allowed to move beyond its current containment. Are you prepared to fight a vision of yourself, twisted almost beyond recognition, lunging after you with wide bulbous eyes, unnaturally long arms, and a distended jaw hanging down below its neck? Better hope you never have to find out. The Devil on Your Shoulder your guardian angel. These are expressions that we've all heard countless times. Of course, they're not supposed to be taken literally. None of us have a heavenly spirit looking over us and protecting us from harm, in the same way that nobody really has a little red-skinned imp whispering encouragement to commit atrocious deeds in someone's ear. They're metaphors. Guardian angel refers to any instance of seemingly divine intervention, but it's more often a coincidence that ends up benefiting a person when they need it most. And the devil on your shoulder, that's temptation. The little voice in the back of your head that sometimes eggs you on to do something you know you shouldn't. But what if there was a being that was both a demonic, malicious creature that also acted as a guardian for someone unable to protect themselves? Is it even possible for a being to be both angel and devil? And who out there could ever qualify for such holy and hellish protection? Ombre Rouge was once a fairly normal place to live, a small Louisiana town in one of the smallest of these 50 United States. Its name was derived from the French language, translating to Red Shadow, an ominous name for a township that was otherwise so uninteresting and forgettable. In fact, if things had never panned out the way they had, Ombre Rouge would have stayed that way. Just a place where nothing interesting ever happened. All of that changed, of course, when the disappearances started. For anyone who might be too young to remember them, the mid-2000s were a turbulent time. The Iraq War was in full swing, and a nationwide financial crisis was rapidly approaching. But in the midst of all this global chaos and instability, the residents of Ombre Rouge were soon to be caught in the thralls of their very own shared torment. At first, like with most bad things, it started small. One person went missing, an unfortunate occurrence, but not exactly unheard of. Sadly, these things happen, especially when you live so close to the swamplands of Louisiana. People wander out into the marsh, under the searing heat of the sun, only to suffer heat stroke, collapse, and end up buried in the dark, dank mud, never to be seen again. Few of those living in the town took much notice of the first disappearance. Apart from the missing person's relatives, many just shrugged off the news. As sad as it was, most of the townsfolk were just grateful it hadn't happened to any of their own family or friends. Maybe it was that ignorance, that lack of vigilance or reaction, that meant a second resident would also be reported missing, not long after the first. But this time was different. Unlike the previous disappearance, this one had an eyewitness. Clement Donovan, known to locals as Clem, had spotted a passerby while taking out bags of garbage. This unassuming pedestrian was the second disappearance victim. Thinking little of the man who just seemed to be walking home, Clem went back inside. A split second later, he heard a scream from outside and rushed back to his dimly lit porch. 
It was there that Clem claimed he saw something retreating towards the nearby woods. However, Clem's wild story of something not quite human wasn't taken seriously by local police. He even managed to snap a grainy photo on his clamshell cell phone. But back in 2005, <laughs> phone cameras were nowhere near as advanced as they are today. Most Ombre Rouge locals wrote Clem off as a crazy old man at best. But worst, it made him look like someone who was trying to exploit or make light of the disappearances, something that garnered him a lot of dirty looks from his neighbors. That was until a number of other residents started reporting they had also witnessed a humanoid creature. It's hard to say if any of these eyewitnesses were genuine and how many were just people latching on to Clem's story. Regardless, the disappearances hadn't stopped, and it didn't take long for an unknown organization to roll into Empre Rouge after hearing the rumors of a creature sighting. A few residents, even the local sheriff's department, thought these shady figures were a division of forensic specialists here to aid in the investigations into the missing persons. The more conspiratorial folks living in the town had a different explanation, that the newcomers were a deep state-controlled, top-secret government group, there to assess the possibility that there really was some kind of monster on the loose. Not long after this group had arrived in Ombre Rouge, the number of residents going missing seemed to dwindle. On the 18th of December, 2005, they packed up and left town giving no explanation to the local police. Nobody knew if this secretive foundation had actually uncovered the perpetrator responsible for all the disappearances, if there even was any creature like the rumors said. But whatever had transpired in that Louisiana swamp town, one thing was clear. The moment the foundation left, nobody else went missing from Empre Rouge, or at least not for over a decade. Before then, however, little else of note happened in Ombre Rouge after the initial spate of missing persons cases. This apart from a car accident that took place just under a year after the various disappearances ended. A heavily injured man by the name of Simon Hayes was taken to a local hospital, suffering from a severe concussion. Simon had been involved in a collision with a car on the 11th of November 2006. The doctors that examined him determined that Simon had been left with short-term retrograde amnesia, a condition that affected all his memories from prior to the accident. It was due to this that he was unable to recall events that occurred in the years before he'd sustained his injuries. Now, what is it that makes a random, if unfortunate, car accident victim so significant? Well, Simon Hayes actually became the first person in Ombre Rouge to be declared missing in almost a decade. In 2016, 10 years after his accident, and 11 after the original slew of disappearances, Simon vanished when returning to his hometown in Louisiana to visit his family. Naturally, Simon Hayes wouldn't be the last familiar face to return to the town. A repetition of such similar and strange occurrences as before also brought the mysterious foundation rolling back in. Little did the townsfolk know, in the year that had followed the group's original exodus from Empre Rouge, they had lost something. On the exact same day Simon suffered his accident, whatever it was the foundation had left town with had managed to escape. Perhaps this was a purely coincidental occurrence, but what if it wasn't? After all, road traffic collisions take place all the time all over the world. But an accident happening in a town with a history of people going missing on the exact same day that this thing escaped captivity? Maybe there was a link between the two events. At the very least, the Foundation seemed to think so. Some of the more astute people living in the Swampside town noticed black armored transport vehicles moving into their neighborhoods men in body armor locking down the whole of Empre Rouge. These didn't seem like local police. They weren't even the National Guard, although they were certainly heavily armed enough to cause concern. This unit of specially trained operatives quickly took control of the entire township, their authority never questioned by the Sheriff's Department. The place was small enough, isolated by surrounding swamps and marshland, it was easy for Mobile Task Force Epsilon-6 to get away with an operation like this. Before the people of Ombre Rouge had time to argue, the task force had already begun their investigation. The newest series of disappearances had started in 2016 with Simon Hayes mysteriously vanishing and had continued two years later in 2018. Just like the first bait back in 2005, 
There were sporadic and unconfirmed eyewitness accounts of a creature, shaped like a human but considerably taller, almost two meters in height. Most witnesses reported only ever seeing this local boogeyman at nighttime, making it much harder to see in detail. Although a few seemed to state its skin was deep red, unlike any natural human skin tone. While before, residents of the Louisiana Swamp Town had brushed off stories like this as nothing more than rumors and urban legends, the Foundation seemed pretty receptive to the idea of some kind of monster on the loose in the marshland. And after all, they had good reason to believe such an outlandish story, because it was the same creature that had already escaped from them in 2006. Continuing their investigation into the link between Simon Hayes and this creature, Mobile Task Force Epsilon-6, also known by the codename The Village Idiots, arrived at Hayes' place of residence. Kicking the door down, breaching the house, they began a room-by-room -room sweep, looking for any clues that would explain why the monster they'd captured escaped on the same day as Simon's accident. One of the MTF operatives uncovered something, an envelope stashed in the home Simon had grown up in. He opened it cautiously, a collection of papers that were contained inside came spilling out. There were a series of simple drawings on paper that seemed to be more than a few years old. The crudeness of the hand-scrawled pictures and age of the paper seemed to imply that they had been created by a child. A number of the drawings depicted the same thing, a red-skinned creature, just like the one the townsfolk had reported seeing. With them was a note, written by Simon's mother, which read, Found these old drawings of yours. Thought you might like to see them again. Welcome home. There was a link, an unclear, maybe tangential connection, but one that was growing the more information the Foundation uncovered. Whatever this being was, a very young Simon Hayes had seen it while growing up in Ombre Rouge. Due to the short-term retrograde amnesia that he'd sustained after his accident, he wouldn't have remembered it, but perhaps this thing remembered him. Did that mean the pair of them might be linked somehow? Not just by coincidence, but some kind of connection that allowed the creature to escape its captivity on the exact day Simon had his car accident. A connection that had drawn Hayes back home to Ombre Rouge, or drawn the beast to Simon to kidnap him. Moving fast, MTF Epsilon-6 began to rapidly sweep the remainder of the town, searching for any further signs that would lead them to the whereabouts of either Simon Hayes or this elusive crimson-skinned boogeyman. They interviewed residents and chased cold leads, before eventually backing their target into a corner. The Foundation's MTF operatives mapped the location of every eyewitness report of the creature, using that information to track it back to a possible point of origin. It was a barn, left abandoned, practically falling apart as it stood in a state of disrepair just outside the small Louisiana town. Under the cover of darkness, the task force approached the wooden structure, weapons locked and loaded, keeping them trained on the barn. Cautiously moving closer, remaining on high alert, the squad activated their night vision. There was a low, almost undetectable sound of movement coming from within the barn. Slowly, the MTF's leader pushed open the wooden door and peeked inside. It was there he saw what they had been looking for, the thing that had escaped the Foundation over ten years before, SCP-3631, a man and his monster. The beast was just over six feet tall, its skin a bloody shade of crimson, just as some of the eyewitnesses had described. It sported a pair of arms and bipedal legs, giving it a humanoid shape. However, that was exactly where its likeness to human beings ended. The creature, later designated as SCP-3631-1, lacked ears, eyes, or a nose, only a wide gaping maw of sharp teeth. Its face was covered in holes that twitched and puckered like smaller miniature mouths. In actuality, it used these orifices for various senses. It smelled, saw, and detected sounds through the holes in its otherwise mostly featureless face. As the members of MTF Epsilon-6 entered the barn stealthily, making sure not to alert SCP-3631-1, they sighted something else. Someone else was in the barn with it, a man. Not a dead victim or another monster like SCP-3631-1, but an actual living, breathing human man. MTF Epsilon-6's commander gave his squad the signal to engage. Hearing the sounds of weapons cocking around it, the creature turned and snarled, crawling on all fours like an animalistic predator. At first it reared back, 
It wasn't until one member of the task force approached that SCP-3631-1 retaliated, attacking the Foundation operatives in a frenzy. Following a prolonged and bloody exchange, MTF Epsilon-6 managed to subdue the creature and were able to once again return it to Foundation captivity. But this time, unlike back in 2005, they had SCP-3631-2 as well. As the red monster was prepped for transport, a survivor of the task force noticed something, an ID, perhaps a driver's license, on the man's person. The Epsilon-6 operative picked the cart up, wiping away smears of blood with a gloved finger, enough to reveal a single, familiar name printed on it, Simon Hayes. Before long, just like last time, the Foundation rolled back out of Ombre Rouge, leaving the Louisiana townsfolk none the wiser about what had happened there. Little did they know, the red shadow hanging over their home had been lifted, but it had come at the cost of a number of disappearances that would remain unsolved. People who would never be found, families forced to go on without ever getting answers. When he was returned to the Foundation's labs, SCP-3631-2 was sent for extensive examination. Given the severity of the invasive organ transplants he'd undergone, it was impossible to tell if he was, in fact, Simon. The creature had been regularly replacing the man's internal organs on a monthly basis whenever they showed signs of decay or failing. Somehow, despite the high risk of blood loss and infection posed by this crude form of surgery, the subject had remained alive. But he was unable to speak, conscious, but showing very limited responses to stimuli. Nobody knows why the carnivorous nocturnal monster SCP-3631-1 took this man captive. In the same vein, it is unclear why the creature felt such a need to protect him, going to such lengths as hunting for replacement organs from unwilling donors. Perhaps in a grisly, twisted way, SCP-3631-1 was this man's guardian angel, or maybe more a devil on his shoulder. I wonder, is it really possible for something to be both? If there's anything that recent years have sadly taught us, it's that diseases are an insidious and formidable enemy that can take you by surprise. Whether it's bacterial, a virus, a fungal infection, or even an unfortunate genetic mutation like cancer, Alzheimer's, or multiple sclerosis, sometimes dealing with a dangerous pathogen could leave you praying for a run-in with SCP-682 after all. At least getting devoured by a giant evil reptile is a quick death. But take a page out of the SCP Foundation's book. Sometimes the best response to an imminent threat is containment and research. One of the first rules of combat is to know your enemy. It may seem like a tall order to have to write the book on dangerous diseases, but thankfully that book has already been written. It's SCP-1025, the Encyclopedia of Common Diseases. This handy reader-friendly volume will tell you everything you need to know about all the common maladies you may find yourself facing, and a whole lot more. From the sniffles to lung cancer, from a cold sore to necrotizing fasciitis. You may be thinking, why would I need some dusty old book to tell me about diseases? I can always just go to WebMD. But you don't want that. You know what the internet is like. They'll just tell you you're sick and you don't want them putting silly ideas in your head like that. How about you open up to a random page and we'll take a look. There. See? The common cold. Classic. Let's see the description. The common cold is a virus that affects the upper respiratory tract. Its duration is typically a maximum of two weeks, and its primary symptoms include headaches, muscle aches, a cough, a runny nose, raised temperature, pressure in the ears or face, and loss of taste or smell. See? Simple, straightforward, and objective. Exactly what you need. <coughs> Did you just cough? Hmm, that's strange. Hmm, and come to think of it, your nose is looking a little red. Do you need a tissue? Or perhaps a throat lozenge? Your voice seems a little hoarse. Perhaps you ought to take a break and lay down. You really don't look so good. Seems like the common cold to us. Thankfully, you shouldn't have to worry about it for more than two weeks. Oh, and that reminds me. There is a certain anomalous effect to the Encyclopedia of Common Diseases. Whenever you read about a pathogen in the Encyclopedia of Common Diseases, you catch it, manifesting even its most severe symptoms in an extremely brief period of time. Of course, this isn't that much of a problem if you just read the article about having a sore throat or a stomach bug. But what if you read the page for Ebola? 
Suddenly, you're half dead and bleeding from the eyes. Or the bubonic plague, or a disease that humanity has never even faced before. And what if, worst of all, the people who catch the diseases from this book continue to be contagious to others? It could be the basis for a world-destroying biological weapon and, at the very least, a bona fide Keter class anomaly. When the SCP Foundation got their hands on this little hardcover anomalous nightmare, the researchers handling this thing realized it needed to be kept under lock and key. A new provisional site was created just to contain and research it without the risk of its anomalous effects starting an unstoppable global pandemic. The base was an isolated underground bunker, containing an even more high-security containment unit to store the book itself. A vault surrounded by at least 10 armed guards at any given time, rotated twice weekly, and checked for any infectious agents. There was even a powerful thermite bomb stored beneath the vault, set to go off and annihilate the entire chamber if the plausible risk of a containment breach was detected. It may seem insane to put in this many security failsafes for a simple anomalous book, but the SCP Foundation has dealt with dangerous books before. Take SCP-140, also known as an incomplete chronicle. This dangerous historical volume chronicles the living history of the Davites, an extinct culture of sadistic sorcerers closely tied to the mythos of the Scarlet King. Whenever ink or blood is brought into the presence of this book, it absorbs the material, expanding the Davite history and bringing their terrifying rule ever closer to the modern day. Or take SCP-3512, The More You Know, A Pickup Artist's Bible, a deadly instruction manual made by a mind-controlling group of interests known as the Fifthists. This book gave its sinister practitioners the tools to control the minds of their potential romantic partners, often leading to their deaths. While it may not be quite as apocalyptic as SCP-1025 or SCP-140, the fact that there are so many in circulation still makes it a dangerous threat. Point is, a book can be a dangerous thing, especially if its pages have the potential to unlock deadly diseases like SCP-1025. As you can expect with an infectious Keter-class anomaly of this magnitude, procedures around this one were rigorous. The site staff was a skeleton crew, observing strict quarantine procedures to prevent any potential infection from leaking out into the wider world. Research into the history of the book was inconclusive, despite a bevy of Foundation resources being poured into finding any worthwhile leads on the author or publisher of the book. Nothing. It was an absolute mystery who or what had put this XK-class end-of-the-world scenario waiting to happen here on Earth. But now it was the job of these intrepid researchers to discover the full extent of its potential dangers. 27 D-Class subjects were allocated to the base for testing. By the time the process was over, none of these unlucky prisoners would remain alive. The test started much like this video. The researchers forced a D-Class to read the section on the common cold. Within two hours, the subject began coughing. Upon being asked, they also reported feeling physically achy, though they attributed the ache to sleeping on an uncomfortable D-Class cot every night. The researchers were concerned already. The incubation period for the common cold meaning the period a person is infected before showing active symptoms can be as long as three days. Two hours is unprecedented. Next, a D-Class was told to read the section on chickenpox, a common childhood malady that can be considerably more dangerous in adulthood. Within an hour of being exposed, the D-Class repeatedly scratched no less than five points on her body repeatedly. While she claimed that this was because of the itchy D-Class jumpsuits, it was too eerily close to a symptom of chickenpox to be ignored. The medical history of this D-Class also showed that she'd suffered chickenpox in childhood, suggesting that SCP-1025 infections have the power to override previous immunities. Next, things got a little more serious. They tested the section on lung cancer on a D-Class with no family history of lung conditions. Not long after, the researchers noted that the D-Class coughed an unusual number of times. Not only that, they picked up irregularities in the D-Class's breathing that appeared to be characteristic of lung cancer. While the D-Class did not report any feelings of chest pain or discomfort, the researchers had him terminated and dissected. No tumors were found. A researcher noted that they didn't wait long enough for proper tumor manifestation. They knew they heard that D-Class coughing. The researchers were so concerned by the results of the previous test, they repeated it exactly with another D-Class, who they then observed over a period of seven days to track tumor manifestation. 
Researchers made a note of an unusual amount of coughing and wheezing from the subject over this period of time. The D-class was then terminated and dissected. But surprise, surprise, no tumors. Researchers began to consider the frightening possibility that signs of SCP-1025-induced illnesses disappear after the victims die, meaning that a pandemic started by SCP-1025 would be impossible to properly track and respond to. Things were only getting scarier and scarier for the SCP-1025 researchers, sequestered away in that isolated foundation bunker. Researchers continued to delve further into the lung cancer rabbit hole. This time, however, they didn't wait for the subject to die before looking at their insides. They instead performed a vivisection on the subject, only to find that despite the victim still being alive and displaying some of the key symptoms of lung cancer, there were no tumors. What could this mean? These diseases weren't behaving like any of their non-anomalous counterparts. What other differences could we be dealing with here? Infectious lung cancer? And what if there are more books out there, like time bombs just waiting to go off? The tests continued, getting more isolated and more intense. In the end, the SCP-1025 site was staffed by only three researchers and two agents acting as guards. D-classes were sent in one by one to minimize ration requirements. It seemed that they could have been dealing with one of the most dangerous anomalies of all time. Even working with it could be a trigger for the apocalypse if the proper containment and quarantine procedures weren't observed. Things got so out of hand that a D-class without an appendix was told to read the section on appendicitis, and researchers still observed him exhibiting symptoms of the condition. He was vivisected, and while the appendix was still not present, the organs in the area where the appendix would have been seemed redder than usual. When would this nightmare end? Well, it would actually end much sooner than anyone involved would anticipate. Despite never even reading SCP-1025 himself, a researcher developed a strange, persistent cough and was quarantined in a containment chamber by his concerned colleagues. On the seventh day of his containment, he seemed to be slightly taller than before, a symptom of SCP-016, a deadly, anomalous bloodborne pathogen that multiplies wildly and rewrites the genetic structure of its host if placed into a high-stress situation. This led to a number of terrifying revelations. Not only did the book have the potential to inflict a number of anomalous diseases, but it could also potentially do so by pure proximity, even if you don't actually read it. What other anomalous diseases could be on the table now? What about SCP-008? A terrifying prion with both 100% virality and 100% lethality. Or SCP-742? a retrovirus that slowly but surely transforms its victims into cannibalistic monsters, or even the horrifying SCP-217, the disease that slowly converts your entire body into a mechanical nightmare. There would be no limit to the horrors SCP-1025 could unleash on the world if it ever got out. They needed to keep this thing locked up at any cost. That's when the infected researcher escaped, and all hell broke loose. The isolated facility went dark for 72 hours. After not being able to get into contact with any other Foundation bases during that time, a recovery team was sent to investigate the mystery. One agent and one researcher were found in the observation booth, wearing biological containment suits. Another agent was found crawling through the air ducts with his handgun drawn, a crazed look in his eye. An additional researcher had locked himself in the barracks with a homemade flamethrower, paranoid about infection. And the final agent was found dead in a storage locker, with some empty bottles and ration packages, after having given the door an airtight seal to prevent infection, then dying of suffocation inside. The O5 Council shuttered the entire investigation. SCP-1025 was downgraded from Keter to Safe Class, then placed in a storage locker. The whole thing was considered a wash. We know what you're probably wondering. Why? If this anomaly was so incredibly dangerous, why on earth would the O5 Council and the rest of the Foundation be dealing with it so casually? Well, that's simple. The initial batch of researchers had grievously misjudged the actual anomalous effect of SCP-1025. It doesn't give diseases to those who read its text. Instead, it induces a form of hypochondria by proxy to those around the reader. In other words, while SCP-1025 has no effect on the reader, it makes everyone around them merely believe that they've come down with a terrible illness. 
The few members of staff in that isolated site had been killing and dissecting D-classes for no reason. In effect, they had all effectively gone mad due to the anomalous effects of SCP-1025 and the paranoia induced by pressure and isolation. Much like your average hypochondriac, they warped the data to fit the worst possible outcome rather than the most mundane and likely. As an old medical expression goes, when you see hoof prints, think horses, not zebras. The entire thing had been a terrifying waste of time, money, and human life. So perhaps in the end, the Encyclopedia of Common Diseases is a lot more like WebMD than we thought. It's not nearly as useful as getting a consultation with an actual doctor, and, of course, it's liable to put some very strange ideas in your head. Happy birthday. It's your day to enjoy however you want, with lots of gifts and sweets. And look, a little friend is here to help you celebrate. It's the birthday monkey, and he has a song to sing. Dating back to the 1940s, SCP-983 is one of the most harmless-looking objects in the SCP Foundation's possession. It's an old-fashioned mechanical monkey, a common wind-up toy from the old days. It's dressed in a sharp little vest and holds a tiny bell and striking rod for making music. It seems to be a simple toy, the kind that would annoy a tired parent as it plays its little tune over and over, but nothing more. But this is no ordinary wind-up toy. SCP-983 is capable of sounds and even speech that doesn't seem to match up with its design, and an investigation reveals it doesn't have any signs as to how it was constructed. No screws, seams, or markings that would be common on a toy, and no voice box or other mechanical feature that would allow for speech. But despite these oddities, it seems to be a normal toy that can be handled safely and played with. On every day, but one, that is. Because SCP-983 has a second purpose, and on one special day, it has a gift for its handler. It can be a gift of joy or a gift of terror. Nicknamed the Birthday Monkey, SCP-983 activates when it is handled by someone within the 24-hour period of their birthday. It seems to be able to tell when this period of time happens automatically, and as soon as it becomes aware, a series of surprises begin to surface for the lucky, or unlucky, handler. It starts with a little leap. As soon as SCP-983 becomes aware of the birthday boy or girl, it'll do a charming little backflip. It'll then lift its bell and start singing the same song. A ring-a-ding-ding, -ding, it's your birthday! To this day, the Foundation has not been able to figure out exactly where this voice comes from, and it follows this by ringing its bell. The tone of the bell varies widely, in ways that the instrument should not be able to create, ranging from low tones to painfully high-pitched tones. And that's where the horror begins. The birthday monkey doesn't just want to sing a song, it wants to play a game. The song will repeat every three to four seconds, marked by rings of the bell. And for every ring of the bell, the birthday boy or girl will age a year, continuing until they die of old age or win the game. But how does one win the game before it's too late? No one is sure, but studies of this strange toy in action indicate that it involves singing along and timing it correctly. It's probably a little hard to do that while aging to death in seconds, but no one said SCPs play fair. But in the event that someone actually does manage to survive the birthday monkey's game, it has a prize for them. When the sing-along is complete, SCP-983 will let out an enthusiastic shout of birthday, ring its bell, and drop a single gumdrop from its bell. But which gumdrop depends on just how well the birthday victim did. A perfect sing-along will result in a clear candy that seems to glow. If it's a little less than perfect, the candy won't glow, but it'll work the same. And both candies have a very valuable property. When eaten, the candy will immediately reverse any age loss during the game. But does the perfect score give another prize? Studies of the rare glowing candy led the Foundation to believe that it may also provide a bonus effect making the person who eats it younger and giving them a longer lifespan or better health. But this is largely guesswork, 
because the candy is produced so rarely and the effects would only become clear after years or decades of study. But not all candies are to be eaten. Many candies of different appearance and quality have been produced. All can be eaten safely, except the black ones, which represent a failed sing-along. The effects of this candy were discovered the hard way, because the first time SCP-983 was activated, it was activated in the wild, before the Foundation had secured it. And everyone knows that an SCP in the wild can be a terrible thing. It was at a local flea market when the buyer noticed the sharp-dressed little monkey. The buyer, having a friend who loved monkeys, thought this would be a perfect gift. The seller was not as enthusiastic and warned the buyer that it shouldn't be handled or even seen by anyone on their birthday. But even the seller didn't really believe this, saying that it might have just been an old legend that had been passed down for years. It didn't dissuade the buyer, and off the monkey went to its new home. SCP-983 was activated at an office party where the monkey was presented as a gift. The guest of honor loved it at first, until it started singing. The staff noticed that as the monkey kept singing, their co-worker became more and more upset. The monkey kept singing, and he started to search for a way to turn it off. But there was no button or any other way to deactivate it. And that's when the co-workers noticed something disturbing. The honoree seemed to be getting weaker and weaker, and there were even streaks of gray appearing in his hair. His skin was getting more wrinkled and weathered. Soon his hair was entirely gray, and he simply returned the monkey to where it was as it continued to sing. He seemed to give up, begged for someone to turn it off, and waited to expire. By the time the Foundation arrived on the scene, it was already too late. There was nothing left of the birthday boy but a desiccated skeletal corpse. The monkey had been able to sing at least 30 more verses, and no one had truly understood what was going on. They reacted with confusion and inaction, unable to contain the monkey's dangerous game. Even the Foundation didn't understand SCP-983 at first, so they let the object continue singing until the body degraded into a simple skeleton. That's when the monkey exclaimed its finishing phrase and released a single black gumdrop. While no one ate the gumdrop, the Foundation observed that it seemed to hypnotize people around it, as if it was compelling them to do something. What is lurking within the black gumdrops, and do they want to be consumed? The birthday monkey was taken into SCP custody, and it became clear that it was harmless to everyone for 364 days of the year. The Foundation wanted to understand more about this odd toy, so they fell back on their best resource for testing, D-Class personnel, who got the chance to show off their singing skills with much higher stakes than your average round of karaoke. Most of the tests were routine, with controlled activation showing how to deactivate the monkey or providing up-close studies of its devastating effects. But one test hinted that this specimen could be more dangerous than thought. Few people volunteer for testing duty at the SCP Foundation, but that wasn't the case for one now-classified subject. Her birthday was approaching, and she surprisingly volunteered for the test that could only be done on your birthday. She had an oddly upbeat attitude and seemed oddly excited about her birthday. The test was approved, and she was given limited information. She was given the monkey as a wrapped gift, told it would sing, and encouraged to sing along for a video. But her reaction indicated she might know more than expected. As soon as the gift was unwrapped, the SCP began singing. After missing the first verse, the subject picked up the words and started to sing along, not just competently, but perfectly and enthusiastically. Soon enough, she started aging rapidly, but didn't seem distressed by this at all. She maintained her high level of enthusiasm even as the monkey sang for over 40 verses and aged her over 40 years. She seemed unaware of these drastic changes, and never missed a beat of the song until the monkey issued its finishing exclamation. And now, it was time for her prize. The gumdrop that fell from the bell was a new one, completely white and almost shockingly bright. It glowed, and the subject was immediately enchanted by it. Even the attending scientists and staff couldn't help but comment on how impressive it was. 
The subject was allowed to consume it to see its effects, and was monitored for an hour afterward. When nothing unusual happened besides the reversal of the aging, the subject was excused to return to her quarters. And that's when things took a shocking turn. In an effect never seen before, the subject suddenly exploded with a brilliant burst of white light. Whatever this light was, it was strong enough to knock out all the cameras in the vicinity. Everyone in her presence was temporarily blinded, with it taking five minutes for their eyesight to return. No long-term ill effects were shown, but the staff that entered the room after the blast noticed that the odd glow remained in the room. And that wasn't the only odd thing. The test subject was nowhere to be found, and has never been seen again. The Foundation is on high alert for this test subject, but she seems to be staying below the radar, if she's even human at all anymore. While there is no physical sign of her, the Foundation has observed odd patterns of electromagnetic activity in the area and is following reports of light fixtures needing to be replaced. It was clear that SCP-983 was much more unpredictable than expected. While still classified as safe, the Foundation is keeping SCP-983 under tighter lock and key these days. All technicians who handle it are carefully vetted to ensure that they are nowhere near their birthday. In case of accidental exposure, the Foundation has prepared emergency kits with detailed instructions for how to complete the Birthday Monkey's deadly sing-along game. But as with all things, the Foundation is prepared for anything. In the event of a failure, the remains will be disposed of by vetted staff. Any candies produced are to be taken into custody by the Foundation and studied for unusual properties, but are not to be consumed without full containment procedures and approval from senior staff. The only exception is D-Class testing, but even in those cases, one rule remains intact. No one is ever to consume the black candies. And caution is encouraged around the birthday monkey, lest you wind up in a sing-along for your life. From the Garden of Eden to the top corner of your English teacher's desk, apples have played an equal role in history's most remarkable days and also its most mundane. The sounds of teeth snapping through the skin, sinking into flesh, and spitting out seeds echo through space forever and onward. And for most of our earthly hours consumed by appetite, it has been documented to be a lopsided relationship between these two things, man and apple. Man getting the sweet taste and abundant nutrients, apples getting nothing but pain and stomach acids. But this story is not found in our history. Buried in the lawful patterns of predator and prey, we stumble upon an irregularity, an inversion, an instance of apples biting back. SCP-4608, also known as Appleseed, was a 60-acre apple orchard containing over 22,000 trees, located just on the outskirts of Milan, Indiana. A town so small it strains your eyes as you squint to find it with a microscope, hovering just over a map. And to see what was actually happening within the curious fringes of society took even greater exploration, not just of the eyes, but also of the mind. Because what would eventually be seen would not so easily be comprehended. Physical senses are just the surface, and we need to go deeper. Our story begins with a great logging company looking to take ownership of the most fertile land they could find in the Great Lakes region. Ideally land that overproduces conifer growth so that the return on their investment would be plentiful and perpetual. These lumberjacked men knew what they wanted. Beneath their red flannel shirts and muddy boots was a deep intelligence and understanding of nature. Their process of assessing the land's value was meticulously calculated. They knew the soil, both by the experience of their calloused hands and the literature of their study. They tracked various bird species' migration patterns in the area to assess what kind of seeds they'd be carrying and contributing to soil by way of their stool. They understood the local laws relating to clear-cutting and conservation and how both would affect their profit margins. This is all to say it wasn't just a speculative purchase. This was planned through and through and dwelled on. And yet, even then, with scrupulous eyes and careful crew, they missed the warning signs. SCP-4608 checked all their boxes and then some. What could go wrong? And so they acquired the land unwittingly purchasing the peril that came with it. On the first day of owning the property, one crew member noticed the branches did not sway in the same direction as the wind blew, 
He noticed the leaves didn't float down in agreement with their feathery weight, but rather crashed to the soil like two-dimensional anvils and grand pianos. The roots were not ones you simply trip over. Instead, it seemed as if they stuck their leg out to trip you. When birds perched themselves up high and sang their songs, their cadence carried all the eeriness of an SOS. With all this said, he was happy to have acquired the land, and having already picked up and moved his family from the west coast to now live and work out in Milan, Indiana, he decided it was best to look past his concerns. After all, it was the first day on the new site, and excitement was in the air, but with it also an amorphous, anxious energy. During the first logging expedition within SCP-4608, this same member of the crew hiked the grounds to better familiarize himself with the environment he'd be working on, hoping that if he managed the land properly and extracted the lumber as efficiently as his late father did, he would be able to help build the business and give his children the life he always promised them. He brought with him his notepad and took detailed records of his surroundings. He figured to achieve his goals and sustain long-term yields, he'd have to cooperate with his environment, but he never questioned if his environment wanted to cooperate with him. Would this question have changed the course of action? Or is brooding on the preference of plants an empty gesture best left for hippies at Woodstock? Either way, the orchard let it be known how it felt about a collaboration when hours later, the man was found dead. It was first believed by his co-workers to be a result of a safety equipment malfunction. Maybe it was a simple matter of thinking the skitter was in park when it was really in neutral. Maybe the knuckle boom loader went on the fritz how it does when the humidity ramps up. Maybe machinery really was to blame, in which case you call it a fluke and ask no more. After all, there's only so many questions you can ask a robot. But initial belief is a fickle thing, and it wasn't long until first impressions were called into question by the courts of critical thinking. The questions of the crew, however, only rang briefly, because shortly after the first death fell a sequence of others. In a matter of days, all of the remaining crew members were declared dead or missing, a word reserved for search parties still clinging to hope, a hot potato they would have been wise to abandon. For while it was hope that brought these search parties together, it was hope that sent them off never to be seen again. The Foundation was then alerted to the occurrences surrounding SCP-4608 by police reports accompanied by a photograph. A photograph of an SCP-4608-1, an organism consisting of unidentified plant-like muscular structures and a periderm resembling those found on common hardwoods. From the photograph alone, it was clear that this three-meter-tall organism was capable of committing the violence recently endured. Forceful in its demeanor, aggressive in its presence, and territorial in its perception, the photograph of SCP-4608-1 led to an even bigger question. Is this plant-like creature grown by nature or sown by man? After extensive research by the Foundation, records were retrieved that indicate the entirety of the 60-acre land was sown into life by John Chapman in 1826. Chapman was the type of man you could mistake for a scarecrow, both for reasons of preferred garb and body language. He was treated as such too. His personal space was respected, maybe too much. He spent his life alone, only accompanied and comforted by the things he planted. He maintained these acres all by himself until his eventual death in 1845, and it's then that it's believed SCP-4608 became unstable, reassigning its objective from comfort to chaos. When the newspaper came out the next Sunday, John Chapman's obituary painted him as a priest of the Allen County Church. But was this just the art of illusion? For as far as we know, no records of a chapel or congregation exist. A quiet choir, indeed. Come to think of it, it seems that everything within this 60-acre orchard was destined to be silenced one way or another, by violent force or even by conscious decision-making. See, while the SCP Foundation has had a long track record of subduing anomalies by methods of capture and containment, not all things are suited for locks and chains. SCP-4608 is better covered with a story than a tarp. A fruitless field that once produced at an unmanageable pace is now rendered incapable of supporting growth. Most will think it's due to a toxic spill. In truth, the spill wasn't that of chemicals on soil, but rather corpses on crops. A week after receiving the photograph of 4608-1, Site-81 sent a three-man investigation team into Milan. Their adventure was equally abrupt, a story with no reportable beginning or middle, but simply a predictable end. 
After four days of no communication, the Foundation presumed the three agents no different than their steak dinner, dead meat. And only then, after the Foundation's failure to solve the case, was it understood that what we were to be looking for wasn't people at all, but rather answers to more nebulous questions. What's really happening here? And why is this happening? Following the loss of communication with the investigation team, Site-81 dispatched a high-risk response team, Mobile Strike Force Bravo-7, aka Hometown Heroes. These men had all the makings of heroes, and they were determined to prove themselves worthy of the title. While the Alpha Squad moved north towards the incident site, Beta Squad headed east, and Gamma Squad hurried west. The crews covering all directions of the compass but south, a coincidentally symbolic gesture, as if to say, we will not be taken down. The mission was simple in theory, find out what happened to the previous team and why. But alas, missions never are as easy as their objective statement reads. In practice, some might even call them impossible. As Alpha neared the incident site, they noticed the shadows on the ground beneath them did not resemble the shape of the leaves in the canopy above. They heard small drops of liquid tap, tap, tap on their helmets. Yet, it wasn't raining, was it? Alpha One ran his finger across the top of his helmet and then examined the residue left on his skin. It was raining, just not water. Oh, God! Upon looking up, he witnessed the reasons for both irregularities. Bodies hung from branches by their intestines, casting shadow puppets with their lifeless limbs. Blood dripped down like a leaky faucet. What did this? But before he could even ponder the answer, he heard a loud shriek from his radio, so loud that the radio itself vibrated, shaking its way loose from his hand and falling to the dirt. He bent down and picked it up, and this time gripped tighter, as if to tell whoever was responsible for that noise that they will not get away that easily. He and his crew followed this sound like a game of Marco Polo, blind to what may be ahead. They extended their guns and pointed them into the distant tree line, like zombie arms reaching outward in the pool towards the resonance of Polo, a small comfort in a giant game of distress. As they pressed forward, Alpha Squad proceeded past all signs that pointed them back, stepping over dead bodies like puddles on a rainy day. Soon they found themselves crouching down next to human remains, attending brief and hurried funerals for all their closest comrades, torn between staying to pay respect and marching along to earn it. The chest cavities of the fallen had been ripped open and filled with apples, a grim foresight into what they were up against. But nothing they could have ever imagined would prepare them for what they were about to see, and they wouldn't have to wait long. Another loud shriek from Alpha One's radio. It shot free from his grip and landed again in the dirt. The squad tried to ignore the metaphorical implications of this reoccurrence, quickly picking up the radio and shrugging it off, as if the five-second rule applied equally to communication systems as candy bars. They pressed forward, maybe out of bravery, maybe out of shame of going back. And while moving through the trees, they began to notice something alarming etched on their bark. What was it? There were unnaturally deep grooves on the base of almost every one of the trees. But what exactly were they from? Scratches from an animal or beast? Infection? Decay? Their eyes drew closer, but proximity brought them no clarity. These sigils and symbols could be dated back to a cult Norse religion, but in that moment, they were incomprehensible to the men. Yet the message, even if misinterpreted, was very clear. Beware. Another shrieking cry over the radio. The bullets! The bullets aren't... They're not working! They can't... They can't penetrate the bark! The grass is no greener over on the east side of the orchard, where Beta Squad gets lunged at by an SCP-4608-1. Their defenses are futile, but they fight nonetheless, sending rounds to the attacker's chest, leading to nothing. If SCP-4608 had a health meter, it wouldn't have budged in the slightest. Understanding the negligible impact of their efforts and assessing their injuries, Beta Squad scurries to retreat to an abandoned chapel, taking a brief refuge from war only later to be named. Quickly, they barricade the door. In the chapel, Beta-9 tends to Beta-6's wounds, who is in the worst shape of them all, cut, bloody, and beaten. As he lays there grimacing, he shines his flashlight up and down the chapel's walls, until he finds a reason to stop and holds it steady. Illuminated is an assortment of human skulls, and if this wasn't dramatic enough, he then spotted apple seeds embedded in Beta-6's wounds, apple seeds that were starting to sprout. Beta-9 gave it to him straight. This is gonna hurt. He drew his knife from his belt and lowered it into his comrade's wounds. Beta-9 dug into flesh and bone, picking the seeds out one by one. Beta-6's scream shook the chapel's stained glass windows, 
As Beta-1 stood guard, he saw a blur rip past him, as if life had suddenly been turned up to three times speed. He spun around in a circle to try and keep his eyes on it, but as his vision refocused, he saw Beta-9 was now dead. He then shifted his gaze to Beta-6, who was looking less and less human by the second. Branches began sprouting out of his body like an all-consuming magic beanstalk. Out of his chest, out of his eyes, out of his mouth. And when there were no more orifices to exit, his body exploded making way for the new form that had overtaken him. The barrage of branches broke through the windows. Only two of them were lucky to be on the outskirts of inertia. Outside, Gamma-1 was on his knees thanking his dead comrade for the grenade he stole from his back pocket. I could always count on you to have my back, even in death. One hand holding a grenade and the other on his radio, Gamma-1 called off Alpha-7. Alpha-7, request for backup rescinded. Go grab a burger. I'll take it from here. Gamma-1 slowly glanced up and locked eyes with SCP-4608-2, a large apple tree with 13 human faces embedded into it, a perennial plant with great powers, a gymnosperm that had found a voice. Blood poured from SCP-4608-2's empty eye sockets. Gamma-1 smirks. Get some eye drops, sicko. He crawled over to the beast. The faces began yelling at him in indescribable tongues. Let me refer you to a speech therapist. He jokes as he pulls the pin of the grenade and throws it towards the largest of the 13 mouths. SCP-4608-2 chokes on the grenade, forcing it to inhale deeply, the strength of its lungs pulling Gamma-1 toward it and sucking him in. The grenade goes off. SCP-4608-2 explodes. The surrounding trees scream and combust. The orchard goes up in flames. The bodies of the fallen are given an appropriate cremation. Gamma-1's radio lays face up in the dirt. The voice rattles it awake. It's Alpha-7. Gamma-1! Gamma-1, are you there? Can you hear me? Please. Please. It's Alpha-7. Please. Gamma-1? On October 16th, 1947, Gamma-1 was recovered by the Allen County Fire Department, unconscious and suffering from exhaustion and smoke inhalation. The Site-81 concealment team took control of the situation and quarantined the area using the cover story of a toxic chemical hazard. The members of MTF Bravo 7 were posthumously awarded the Foundation Star for their efforts during the neutralization of SCP-4608. And so, the one question that remains is, how? How did SCP-4608-1 become so dangerous, and how did its danger slip by for so many years? Is its volatility by nature, design, or consequence? Could it be that the Foundation failed to understand the complexity of this creation? During Chapman's lifetime, there were no accidents or fatalities coming from SCP-4608. Yet, there is no reason to believe that SCP-4608-1 wasn't always capable of harm. Maybe it always was capable of mass murders, but simply had no reason to kill. What if the logging company never stepped foot on that land, never brought out their sharp blades and heavy machinery? What if this perilous orchard was in fact docile, but provoked? What if the proverbial tree only falls in the woods when we force our philosophy on it? Though SCP-4608-2 spoke in unidentifiable sounds, the noises were always recognized and recorded as language. It spoke with intent, even if misunderstood. What it screamed is still unclear. Were they pleas for help, or messages of hate? And would one even be worse than the other? John Chapman might argue when facing heavy machinery and trained artillery, would raising your voice even be a moral decision at all? Is fight or flight imbued not just in blood, but also in bark? The fabric of our world is littered with strange doorways if you know where to look for them. Tears, portals, anomalies, all leading to places and planes beyond human imagining and understanding. And SCP-2317, otherwise known as a door to another world, certainly fits that description. Contained and kept at all times under the watch of armed guards, SCP-2317 appears to be a simple and unsuspecting wooden door in its frame. It hardly looks like it requires such extreme round-the-clock security, or needs a strange secretive ritual that the Foundation performs, presumably to keep the door closed. But of course, sometimes the most interesting thing about a closed doorway isn't where it leads, it's what it keeps out. Even by the Foundation's already high standards, the requirements and regulations for personnel who are assigned to SCP-2317 seem oddly specific. Psychological testing is standard practice to work for the Foundation, but an additional hurdle that anyone has to clear before even getting to glimpse at this unassuming wooden door 
is having a score of at least 72 on the Milgram Obedience Examination. It is also mandatory that personnel assigned to maintaining it are both unmarried, with no children or next of kin, as well as an unwavering, unquestioning loyalty to the Foundation, pure devotion to its code and objectives. These may seem like strange requirements. After all, SCP-2317 is just a door, isn't it? Perhaps there's a reason that the Foundation keeps so much of the information about SCP-2317 buried deep under layers upon layers of security, with only the Overseer Council privy to the full details of its strange nature. Knowledge, as they say, is power. But maybe knowing too much about whatever is behind that door can prove deadly. Still, if SCP-2317 is a door to another world, an alternate dimension or parallel reality, it must be safe enough to visit. After all, the Foundation has been sending personnel in there on a regular basis. Daily, in fact. According to the O5 Council, this is done as part of a procedure to maintain active containment of… something lurking beyond that old wooden doorframe. But what could possibly warrant such constant maintenance and surveillance? In accordance with the Foundation's guidelines, all staff are required to rotate out of observing SCP-2317 after every two months, and spend the following third month in full psychological counseling, before they are permitted to return to the containment unit housing the door to another world. It was after one of these month-long periods of evaluation that a Foundation guard was informed that his security clearance has been raised to level 3, and that he'd been selected for the duty of carrying out 220 Calabasas. He knew the name instantly. This was the title given to the daily containment procedure that absolutely had to be carried out. The guard didn't question these orders. After all, he'd been selected precisely because of his loyalty to the Foundation. He did make one request to his commanding officer, however. He wanted to know what had happened to the last guard that had performed the procedure. Didn't make it out of psychological evaluation, the officer replied. Not letting this affect his dedication, the guard was told to prepare for Procedure 220 Calabasas. Along with a fellow member of Foundation security personnel, the guard was instructed to gather everything on a strange list. The first was a pre-selected member of Class D personnel, specifically a convicted murderer. Class D refers to disposable class personnel, expendable individuals recruited by the Foundation for the sole purpose of testing SCPs. Class Ds were usually prison inmates repurposed for SCP testing, and the one chosen for 220 Calabasas was no exception, serving multiple life sentences for murders, or at least that's what the guard had been told. A Foundation personnel member instructed him to refer to the Class Ds solely as the assistant from that point on. Next, the guard collected a live chicken, an obsidian edged knife, a silver aspergillum and aspersorium, to be filled with 500 cc's of holy water, that have been blessed by a priest of the Abrahamic faith, and finally, a one kiloton nuclear device, which according to instructions, was only to be detonated in the unlikely event of a catastrophic containment failure, in other words, the last resort. After following his instructions to the letter and without question, the guard and his colleague were briefed. The Foundation personnel member informed them that he'd be joining and leading them in the procedure, the staff member also specified that henceforth he'd be referred to as the celebrant until the completion of 220 Calabasas. The guard was acutely aware of how specific these instructions were, but trusted in the Foundation, knowing that if they wanted this procedure performed a certain way, then it was in everyone's best interest to carry out the orders to the letter. But what the celebrant then went on to explain raised far more questions about SCP-2317 and the nature of Procedure 220 Calabasas. The Class D joining them wasn't actually a Class D. The assistant, as they were now referred to, was in reality another Foundation staff member, with a Level 4 security clearance specifically tailored to SCP-2317. Every member of staff entering through SCP-2317 and taking an active role in 22 Calabasas needed to be informed that this assistant was not to be harmed or treated as a member of disposable class. Fighting back the nagging question of why the Foundation would employ this subterfuge, the guard along with his fellow security officer, the celebrant and assistant, prepared for their departure through the door to another world at solar noon, when the sun was highest over SCP-2317. 
solar noon, chickens, and holy water. This all seemed like an oddly occult combination for the Foundation. As they entered the old wooden door, beyond lay a barren salt plain, stretching out for kilometers in every direction. This alternate dimension, according to the briefing, was designated SCP-2317 Prime. The guard immediately noticed a ring of seven pillars directly ahead of the group as they entered, each of them bearing intricately detailed engravings unlike anything from any era of ancient history. Procedure 220 Calabasas was carried out quickly but carefully. The guard watching as the celebrant and assistant were careful not to miss a step. First, the celebrant scattered holy water into the center of the pillars with the Aspergillum and Aspersorium, looking down at his feet and keeping a steady pace as he stepped counterclockwise around them. The guard watched intently as the celebrant completed his circuit around the pillars and turned to the assistant, anointing his head with holy water. Seven seals, seven rings, seven thrones for the Scarlet King, he said aloud. The assistant, with the obsidian blade in his hand, took the chicken and dispatched it in sacrifice, letting its blood mix with the holy water. He then repeated the celebrant's circuit in the opposite direction, before stepping into the center of the stone pillars. Blood for the old gods, water for the new king, the assistant recited, pouring the remaining mix of blood and holy water over a patch of salt in the middle of the seven pillars. Even though he knew it wasn't his place to question the foundation, as the 220 Calabasas procedure took place, the guard couldn't help but wonder what all of this was for. It seemed so ritualistic, like something deeply religious or even magical. He never bought into all that occult mumbo jumbo, even while working for the Foundation, but he had learned not to question anything, even the strangest and most inexplicable of sights. Little did he know that beneath his feet, was an ancient and unknowable horror, a beast chained and lying in wait. Contained in a chamber directly underneath the pillars sat an impossibly large creature. Humanoid and obese, its body covered entirely in scales thicker than armor plating. Branch-like horns protruded from its jawless head, pointing up to chains that hung from the seven pillars above. Each one hooked into the entity's back. All but one of the chains was broken, a final withering shackle keeping the devourer of worlds in its underground prison. Ever since 1894 BCE, when Arikshian mystics imprisoned it, the devourer has been waiting patiently for its inevitable freedom. It knows, as well as the Foundation, that nothing can be done to prevent the final chain from one day breaking. Even Procedure 220 Calabasas won't keep the creature contained. It's nothing more than a smokescreen, an act designed to create an illusion of active containment and maintain Foundation morale until a permanent solution can be devised to keep SCP-2317 imprisoned. Of course, if the guard had known this, it would have also explained the need for a one kiloton nuclear device as part of this staged ritual. Procedure 220 Calabasas had all the components to trick everyone below the O5 Council, emulating religious and occult rituals, the increased level of security surrounding the procedure and its purpose, and telling staff that any failure to correctly and completely perform the 220 Calabasas procedure will result in an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. All these elements work together to conceal the truth that one day, the Devourer will escape and lay waste to our dimension. Knowledge is power and maybe knowing too much truly is deadly. Perhaps if the guard had learned any of this, he'd have understood why his predecessor never made it out of psychological evaluation. Maybe if he had questioned the purpose of Procedure 220 Calabasas, he'd have learned the true nature of SCP-2317 and what that doorway kept out. But he was loyal to the Foundation through and through. As the team finished performing 220 Calabasas and returned through the wooden door, the guard took one last glance over his shoulder at the vast salt plain. The entire dimension was calm, silent, but not peaceful. It was patient. The entity had waited centuries for its time, and now all it would take was the breaking of this seventh and final chain. One day. 
The door was closed behind the guard as he, the celebrant, the assistant, and his fellow security officers stepped back through. Their work done and, as far as they knew, preventing catastrophe for another day. Only the Foundation higher-ups, the Overseer Council, are aware of the true danger posed by SCP-2317 and its sole inhabitant. Current predictions are that at some point within the next 30 years, the Devourer of Worlds will be freed. Any and all attempts to repair or recreate the chains holding it in place have so far failed. As such, the O5 Council has elected to continue providing Foundation personnel with the ignorant hope that Procedure 220 Calabasas is an effective strategy for containment. As we've said, sometimes the most interesting thing about a closed door isn't where it leads, it's what it keeps out. In the case of SCP-2317, the unassuming wooden door holds at bay an ancient creature of untold power that will one day break free and wreak havoc in our dimension. Nothing the Foundation does can prevent it or keep it contained behind the door to another world. And only the Overseer Council knows that any and all efforts to do so are futile. With all that in mind, we can only hope that the doorway of SCP-2317 stays closed, at least for a little while longer. Take a brief moment to think back to your younger years, spending long, tiresome hours trapped in a classroom, waiting to hear the noise of that final bell of the day. That sound meant freedom, the end of another grueling six hours at your desk, and the chance to get back to the warm sanctuary of home. If you were lucky, you might not have had to go far to get back to the safety and security of being in your parents' house. Living close enough to the school would mean you could easily walk home when the day was through. But your classmates? Well, they weren't all as lucky. Some of them had miles to travel, all the way across town even. Fortunately, though, the school bus would always be waiting outside at the end of each day, ready to take a gaggle of rowdy kids back home. And if you were one of those kids that had to take the bus, you'll know that the trip home after school was hardly a calm drive. Paper planes and spitballs firing from all directions, wads of chewing gum stuck to the undersides of seats, other kids all around you screaming and yelling at the top of their lungs. Still, it could be worse, right? No, trust us. It could be much, much worse than you can ever imagine. What if one day, the bus that picked you up from school wasn't a bus at all? What if instead, it was SCP-2086? Picture this. One day you get put in detention at school. Maybe you were disrupting a class or were caught spraying graffiti on the outside wall of the gym. Whatever the reason, we're sure you'll think it is unfair that you got held back after school after everyone else had already gone home. But you do your time until finally you're told you can leave. Problem is, your house is on the other side of town, and you've already missed the bus. You make your way off the campus, down the nearest street. Maybe there's a city bus you can catch that'll get you back home. As you stroll away from your school, you realize that the nearest bus stop, the first one on the route home, seems to be further away than you remember it being. Must be just the exhaustion of a long day getting the better of you playing tricks on your mind. It's not like someone could move the bus stop, right? Finally reaching the stop, you notice lights coming down the street after a few moments of waiting quietly. A late bus, just like you hoped for. It pulls up to the next stop, the doors folding open to allow you on board. It's totally empty, save for the driver, but straight away you notice there's something odd about him. He seems drained of color. His movements are weird, more like a puppet on strings than an actual living, breathing human being. Now that you think about it, if it wasn't for the fact he was clearly moving, driving the bus, you might assume that he was a corpse. Then again, maybe he just had a long day too. Taking a seat, you try not to think about it and stare out of the window in boredom. You watch as the route takes you past stop after stop, all of them empty just like the bus itself. But then something unexpected happens. You've ridden the bus to and from school so many times before that you can't help but notice when, for some reason, it takes a wrong turn. Looking out the window, you know you aren't mistaken. The driver has changed direction. Instead of heading towards the nearest stop to home, he's taken the bus towards the furthest edge of town. Desperately, you try yelling at him, asking why he's taken the wrong turn, but the driver stays still, as if he can't even hear what you're saying. 
That's when you notice the smell. You didn't catch it before, but now it's all around you, filling the air inside the bus. It's almost like the scent of disinfectant. The bus now smells the same way a hospital does. But that's not all. The more you breathe it in, the more you feel yourself starting to get woozy, arms and legs getting heavier. Everything around you feels as if it's spinning uncontrollably. Out of the windows, you can just about make out the sight of a junkyard, blurring in and out of focus. It's meant to be abandoned, and yet you're sure you can see movement, massive, indeterminate shapes shifting around in the dark. Finally, your vision goes dark and you fall unconscious onto the floor of the bus. Only, you were never on the bus to begin with. No, although you didn't know it, you were prey to something that just looked like a bus. SCP-2086 And now that it's caught you, you'll never see the light of day again. Now SCP-2086 doesn't just refer to a single creature, not by a long shot. It is the designation given to an entire species of arthropods. Think lobsters, crabs, and spiders, or insects like centipedes and millipedes. Only much bigger. To the untrained eye, and depending on when you look, an instance of SCP-2086 will normally look like any ordinary public transport vehicle, of any make and model, or belonging to any company or transit authority. Usually, though, they look like regular old buses, at least while they're out foraging for food. When born, an SCP-2086 specimen will grow to full juvenile size within a week, usually weighing 200 kilograms or less. Full matured adult instances, however, can weigh approximately 17,000 kilograms. The adults are the ones that go out foraging, leaving the nest to collect food to then bring back to the juvenile SCP-2086s. And by food, we of course mean humans. While out on the roads, matured SCP-2086 creatures are practically identical to the auto vehicles that form their bodies. But the materials that this disguise is made from, the steel, plastic, wood, and glass, they're all actually comprised of specialized chitin, the kind of outer shell you'd find on most arthropods. But underneath that outer shell, that's where you'll find the real horror. Within the main chamber, beneath the flooring of the bus's long inner portion, is stored the pulsing, beating heart of an SCP-2086 specimen. And we don't mean that in a metaphorical sense. If you were to lift up the floorboards of one of these bus-like creatures, you'd see its heart, along with other vital organs like the creature's brain and stomach. What's more, the figure in the front seat that you thought was a living, breathing bus driver actually isn't living or breathing. Not anymore. Preserved in a shell-like substance that the creature is able to produce, the driver is actually a human corpse, acting as a decoy for SCP-2086s. From within the bus body, fibrous appendages reach up into the corpse, almost like incredibly thin hairs. The creature can then use the cadaver essentially as a puppet, a puppet with a dead person's body. That's how an SCP-2086 is able to move its driver around, making it appear more lifelike so it can lure its prey aboard. Think of it like the bioluminescent light that an anglerfish uses to tempt unsuspecting fish into their jaws. Same principle, but with a dramatically different result when it comes to SCP-2086. But if you thought bus creatures with internal organs under the floor and dead meat puppets in the driver's seat weren't creepy enough, there's still much more to SCP-2086s than meets the eye. For example, when they aren't out foraging, the adult creatures can unravel the roof of their bus-shaped outer shell. Underneath is a pair of wings, large enough and strong enough to carry their entire 7,000 kilos of weight off the ground and up into the air. As for eyes, the headlights at the front are, in actual fact, bioluminescent optical organs, allowing the creatures to see their prey even in the dark. Still not horrifying enough? Well, would knowing about their legs help? The wheels underneath an SCP-2086 specimen are also capable of unraveling, forming long gray or black legs like those of a spider. Yes, these are bus creatures with wings and multi-jointed legs. These legs aren't just big, clumsy appendages either. Compared with other arthropods, SCP-2086s are able to use their limbs to perform surprisingly intricate actions and finer levels of manipulations. For instance, a number of specimens have been observed in the wild by the SCP Foundation building shelters out of any materials that they can find near their nesting ground. And where do they normally nest? Wherever there's plenty of scrap metal and hardly any people to notice them. 
Junkyards are the preferred habitats of SCP-2086s and where they will normally establish their colonies. While the juveniles remain within the confines of the colony, adult SCP-2086 specimens will leave to collect humans. Although on occasion, the younger specimens have been known to travel out from their nest and rearrange or relocate signposts for bus stops. They then place them in a route that leads them back towards their nesting ground. It's something worth remembering if your nearest bus stop ever seems to be a little further away from the school than usual. Afterward, the older specimens will travel along the route laid out by the juvenile SCP-2086s, picking up any human passengers that they find waiting at the relocated bus stops. They have to choose their moments wisely, with people boarding and disembarking from the bus usually every few stops. Once an SCP-2086 has as many humans on board as it can carry, with the certainty it won't lose any at the upcoming stop, it secretes a substance similar to chloroform. This fills the inner chamber of the bus, causing that noxious smell, like hospital disinfectant. The chloroform-like substance incapacitates all the passengers on board, rendering them unconscious and readying them to be taken back to the local SCP-2086 colony. Once the adult SCP-2086 has arrived at the junkyard, the juveniles will descend on it, Given their much, much smaller size, they will climb inside the mature specimen and forcibly remove each and every human passenger it is carrying within. Then comes the truly nasty part, feeding time. Each juvenile SCP-2086 will force their captive human through an orifice that is located under the front hood of their vehicle's shell. This sphincter, a circular formation of muscle that can expand and contract to perform a bodily function, is connected to where the steering wheel is found on an adult SCP-2086. The younger creatures will push their human prey through the sphincter, consuming them. Once this has occurred, those hairy appendages in the driver's seat will then latch onto the body of the now-dead human, piercing through their skin, winding up and around their bones. These are the same fibrous hairs used to puppet the deceased corpse and use it to lure others aboard the bus. But these appendages have another function their feeding tubes. They will drain every last drop of blood from the SCP-2086's prey until the body is little more than a husk, at which point the tubes inject a saline solution directly into the cadaver. Afterwards, the inside of the bus fills with that same substance that preserves the corpse, and the process is complete. As horrifying as these creatures are, one of the few upsides of SCP-2086's is that they don't live very long. Female specimens will reproduce after 8 days and produce 20 offspring after this point. Each of these newborns reaches full maturity and size in about a week. On average, SCP-2086s live for 12 to 15 days. Another net positive is, because of their short lifespans, an SCP-2086 specimen doesn't need to feed on a human more than once, as the nutrients it absorbs as a juvenile are enough to sustain it through adulthood. Once it has matured, an SCP-2086 will go out into the nearest city or town to forage for humans, providing food to the next generation. And so the cycle continues. In the future, rather than taking the bus, maybe it's safer to walk. It might mean the difference between you making it home or becoming food. There is something so captivating about ice. It can be beautiful, a shimmering cast of frost over a meadow, or twinkling icicles on a cottage roof. It can also be deadly, a slick of slippery glass on a dark road, or that same icicle from before knocking loose and careening towards your head like a falling dagger. It can be a sleet storm, or a mighty glacier with secrets buried beneath its core. In a remote part of Alaska, the SCP Foundation discovered a particularly unusual kind of ice, with a vivid red hue and some incredibly deadly potential. The Foundation investigated the reports in a remote area on the Alaskan coastline after a tribe of local natives came across the mangled bodies of shipwrecked hunters in the area encased in a block of strange red ice. Mobile Task Force Beta-7, also known as the Hazmatters, were sent in to the site to determine what exactly had occurred and take samples of any anomalous materials to be brought back to the nearest Foundation research site. Agent Bryce made the initial visual inspection of the site and spotted three middle-aged male bodies. Further examination determined that one of the bodies, referred to as Subject Zero, was the original point of contamination for whatever comprised the red ice and caused the men's deaths. 
It has been posited by the investigation team that the other men were infected when they attempted to help Subject Zero reach their boat. Sadly, kindness can sometimes be a killer like that. While sweeping the perimeter, Agent Hughes spotted human footprints leading to the northeast. A three-man team consisting of Agent Hughes, Whitmore, and Cassidy was permitted to follow those tracks and determine if any survivors, or something worse, had escaped the site. Exploration Log A009 allows us to determine what happened next and what the three agents found. Hughes and his team followed the footprints to the entrance of a cave, with the tracks appearing to lead inside. The entrance of the cave was covered with an almost solid sheet of ice, save for a crack in the ice about one meter tall. Beyond this wall, Agent Whitmore spotted the body of a young man, frozen solid in the midst of crawling away from something covered in crystals of red ice. With him was a frozen spear gun that appeared to have been fired just before the young man's death. They could not touch the body to perform a full investigation, but the way in which he was gripping his chest indicated that he might have been fatally stabbed there. As the agents moved further into the cave, they discovered a chamber about five or six meters in diameter, filled with red ice with a pool in the middle. The pool was three meters wide and of an unknown depth. As they pushed further, the agents came across a polar bear. Startled, they fired once at it, before realizing it was already dead. Its fur was dotted with crystals of red ice, creeping its way across the bear's body. Beyond the polar bear, the agent spotted dozens of bodies, all dead animals. There were seals, a snow fox, and finally, a giant spider with a leg span of over a meter. At first, the spider appeared to be frozen like the other creatures, but upon further investigation, it appeared to be made of red ice. Agent Cassidy recognized the spider as SCP-3023, but was told it was impossible. When she pressed for further answers, she was told to ignore it and continue the sweep. Agent Whitmore checked the collection of bodies in the chamber, looking for any humans among them. Meanwhile, Hughes spotted a spear sticking out of the enormous spider, indicating a struggle that took place before it and the young man at the cave's entrance froze. Hughes was interrupted in his task as Agent Cassidy called out from deeper in the cave, saying, I, I think I know where the spider came from. When Hughes followed the sound of her voice, he found something troubling. An aperture, about a meter in diameter, absolutely covered in red ice. It looked like a tunnel, with no ice at all past its entrance, with a dim light coming from somewhere deep inside. He lost sight of Agent Cassidy and realized she must have gone inside of it. Upon further observation, Hughes determined that the walls and the floor of the tunnel were wet, with a red puddle about a meter in. Hughes and Whitmore called to Cassidy, attempting to lead her back out of the tunnel, but received no response. Hughes attempted to go in and retrieve her, but Control forbade him from going any further. After a conversation with Control that had been stricken from the official file, Hughes had relented and agreed to withdraw his remaining team and exit the site. Hughes and Whitmore left the cave without further incident and returned to Foundation Headquarters. In spite of a D-Class recovery team being sent into the cave to search for her, Agent Cassidy's body was never found. The cave was blocked off from the public in order to avoid further civilian contact with the red ice and the red water inside. Though the origin of the red ice in Alaska is not known for sure, this cave and the pool deep within it are thought to be the source of this particular infestation. The official cause of death listed on record for the bodies found in Alaska was internal bleeding, but what really happened to them was something much, much worse. These men had transformed and frozen from the inside out, their blood turning to ice and their cells going solid one at a time. The low ambient temperature in the area are thought to have slowed the freezing process down. You heard that right. The cold kept them from freezing faster, as counterintuitive as it sounds. This prolonged their deaths and kept them conscious up until the very end. Even as their bodies were freezing solid, their very cells turning against them, they were awake and aware of it all. These unfortunate men came into contact with and lost their lives to a substance known as SCP-009. SCP-009 in its liquid form maintained at temperatures between negative 100 and 0 degrees Celsius resembles ordinary distilled water aside from its bright red color. It behaves opposite of water, 
reaching a frozen solid state at higher temperatures and vaporizing into a steam-like gas at temperatures below negative 100 degrees. An attempt to examine SCP-009's atomic structure was unable to achieve conclusive results. The substance looks as if it was made up of normal water molecules, though, obviously, it is much more than simple water. SCP-009 appears relatively harmless at first glance, but its real dangerous potential lies in its ability to contaminate water-based solutions, transferring its properties to them. A contaminated liquid begins to exhibit the same unusual behavior as SCP-009, freezing at temperatures above zero degrees and vaporizing at temperatures below negative 100. It has been shown to effectively contaminate ice, steam, tea, fruit juice, seawater, and blood, in a process taking between three minutes and several hours. These concerning properties raise questions about what SCP-009 and liquids contaminated by it might do if they made contact with a human body. Several D-Class personnel were used as test subjects, exposed to SCP-009 in a controlled environment and observed from a safe distance. When first exposed to SCP-009, the test subjects reported nothing unusual except a slight sensation of warming on the surface of their skin. Then frost began to form across the surface of the exposed area as the subject's body heat raised the substance's temperature. This process took between a minute and a few hours, during which ice crystals began to form along the top layer of the skin. This stage is known as surface conversion. In the next stage, deep tissue conversion, the continued increase in SCP-009's temperature causes a ripple effect of reactions through the subject's body, ice crystals forming in the cells and throughout the blood. The subject remained alive and conscious during this stage. Details about the fourth stage of the process have been expunged from the official record, but it is safe to say that something horrible happened. After several of these experiments were conducted, testing on live D-Class subjects was officially discontinued. There was a possibility of experimentation on SCP-009 regarding its potential application to cold fusion, but this was also eventually discontinued following a disastrous accident at an unnamed Foundation test site. The site was completely destroyed, and pieces of the lead agent conducting the cold fusion research have still not been recovered. For now, SCP-009 is kept under strict containment and only tested under particular highly regulated circumstances. SCP-009 is kept in a sealed storage tank of heat-resistant alloy. It is not to be exposed to any temperatures higher than zero degrees Celsius unless there is official Foundation-sanctioned testing being done. No water-based liquids are allowed within 30 meters of the containment area. The storage tank is outfitted with temperature sensors that are to be monitored at all times in order to prevent the temperature within from rising and is kept cold by three different cooling units. If the sensors or cooling units malfunction for any reason, they must be fixed immediately to prevent disaster. When testing is done on SCP-009, the containment area is kept in a vacuum, and the personnel working with it must wear protective gear. After testing, all involved personnel must quarantine for at least 12 hours. Any living organisms contaminated by SCP-009 must be terminated promptly. While the exact origins of SCP-009 are unclear, it clearly does not follow the laws of nature as we understand them. A Foundation expert in xenospatial physics suggested that SCP-009 may have come from a universe with alternate laws of physics, explaining its reversal of the ordinary conditions for states of matter. During an instance of SCP-507, the reluctant dimension hopper, shifting into an alternate universe, an instance of SCP-009 was unexpectedly observed that may help confirm this theory. In the test area where SCP-507 appeared, red snow fell for about 27 minutes. Grass touched by this red snow began to react and freeze over within a few minutes. The other plant life touched by the snow turned bright red and expanded to a larger size. It also began to sprout bright blue tentacles covered with red mucilage. Upon closer examination, the mucilage turned out to be comprised of small amounts of SCP-009. This raised additional questions. For instance, how are these plants able to survive constant exposure to SCP-009? This matter is currently under investigation. But the prevailing theory is that this plant is an example of plant life from SCP-009's native universe. Whatever it is, and wherever it comes from, 
it should not be allowed to come into contact with Earth-based organic life forms. Well, not unless being horrifically frozen to death by your own body feels like an appealing experience to you. The coastline where SCP-009 was initially discovered and its first victims on record were found was located very close to the ocean. Thankfully, the exact area of contamination was dry and cold enough to keep the red ice from spreading, but if it had been even a few meters closer to the water, it could have spread into the North Pacific Ocean. With contamination of that scale, it could have very easily infected thousands of people, perhaps spreading into other bodies of water and triggering a global extinction event. Because of this threat, several members of the SCP Foundation proposed that SCP-009 be upgraded to Keter class in order to reflect its danger to humanity. However, this request was denied due to the currently effective containment measures in place. The red ice is unable to spread to new hosts, infecting the water supply and turning all living things into frozen husks. For now, let's just hope we don't see any red snowstorms anytime soon. A veteran worker of the SCP Foundation sits at his terminal, performing one of the most critical tasks in the entire organization, creating a file for an as yet undescribed SCP. But there's something terribly wrong. His eyes are glazed over. His mouth hangs open. Is this a zombie or a trained Foundation researcher? What is going on? Like any large international organization, it takes more than just the exciting, action-filled jobs to keep the wheels turning at the SCP Foundation. Sure, the head researchers, guards, mobile task force soldiers, and members of the O5 Command get all the praise, but a legion of number crunchers, cleaners, and paper pushers are equally important. One such person was archivist Walter Bainbridge, who had been tasked with digitizing some of the older records that the Foundation had on file. It was when he was innocently recording the details on SCP-050 through 060 that he first came under the strange and startling effects of SCP-055. But the most peculiar part, as with all incidents of SCP-055's anomalous effects taking hold, is that Walter had no idea any of it was happening. In his new digitized filing system, he first took note of SCP-053, Euclid class, also known as the young girl. This anomaly was a seemingly normal human female child who provoked homicidal insanity in those directly exposed to her. Then SCP-054, safe class, a non-aggressive humanoid female made entirely of, as well as biologically and chemically identical to regular spring water. Next, SCP-056, Euclid class, a being that changes form to suit its environment, but only when all observers lose focus of it. And then, SCP-057, safe class, an underground chamber that crushes the humans who walk within. It was at this point that Walter received a concerned message from one of his superiors at Site-19, Mr. Kovach. The message praised the thorough digitization of the other anomaly's records, but was confused about why Walter had left out any mention of SCP-055. Immediately, Walter was embarrassed. How could he have forgotten SCP-055, that iconic anomaly known for… well, he couldn't quite say off the top of his head, but he'd be sure to look into it. A quick trip to the Site-19 archive showed him that there was actually quite a hefty file on the nature of SCP-055, which must have been the result of a huge number of studies. What struck him as strange was that all the files were filled out in pen rather than being typed up like a traditional file. The majority of these notes were written in shorthand too, as though they were frantically taken during the tests themselves on extremely short notice. There weren't even any redactions. Walter made a mental note of what he had seen, put the file back in its proper place, and headed back to his computer terminal. However, after writing in an almost trance-like state, he looked back on his work to see that he had written an entry on SCP-058, a giant evil bovine heart with insect legs and a scorpion stinger. Strange, he thought. That's when Walter got a call from Mr. Kovach on his Foundation issue phone, and he didn't sound happy. He'd given Walter direct instructions to go back and digitize the files on 055, and instead he'd been working on 058. What was the meaning of this? Walter was typically an extremely loyal and diligent employee, but the verbal barrage from his supervisor had him considering talking back. 
just this once, and hoping it didn't get him demoted to D-Class and thrown into 682's acid bath for playtime. Walter gulped, picked up some courage, and interrupted Mr. Kovach's rant to ask if he had any idea what SCP-055 actually was. The line went silent for a moment, then his supervisor spoke again, this time with less confidence. Uh, of course I can tell you about SCP-055. Uh, it's a classic, one of the first hundred. How could you forget it's, uh, or, yeah, you know, it's, I think it's the one with, um... Another long pause as Mr. Kovach seemed to search for the words, but instead just trailed off into silence. Knowing that some of the anomalies on file were dangerous mimetic hazards, Walter was worried for a moment that he may have accidentally killed his boss by getting him to think too hard about SCP-055. He asked if Mr. Kovach was okay, and finally got a reply. I'm sorry, I seem to have zoned out for a second there. What were we talking about again? But this time it was Walter who couldn't answer. He had no idea at all what the two of them were discussing just moments ago. He felt disoriented and kind of sick, like they'd taken some low-level amnestics. Mr. Kovach told Walter to get back to his filing duties and they'd speak later. Walter then checked the messages he'd received from Mr. Kovach earlier, and there it was, plain as day. You missed 055. Go back and digitize that before proceeding, Mr. K. But Walter had never even heard of an SCP-055 if such an anomaly even existed. What was going on here? In that moment, Walter realized he was dealing with something much stranger than just a standard digitization job. After all, how could he properly complete his duties if SCP-055 seemed to be impossible to speak, write, or even think about, unless you were directly observing it at that moment? Walter had to know, and ask around the entirety of Site-19 to find the answers if he had to. Sadly for Walter, he was about to embark on a much more challenging task than he could have ever imagined. To paraphrase a supposed quote from Socrates, All I know is that I know nothing. And that's also about the extent of the knowledge we have on SCP-055, also known as the anti-meme and the self-keeping secret. What does it look like? When and how was it obtained by the Foundation? What are its anomalous abilities? Is this thing dangerous? We may never know. Because the only anomalous ability of SCP-055 that we're aware of is the fact that nobody is capable of retaining any information about it. It's crucial to note that whatever 055 is, it isn't invisible or indescribable. Foundation personnel are perfectly capable of entering its containment chamber and observing it without incident. But mere minutes after leaving the chamber, any memories of the particulars of 055 seem to spontaneously erase themselves. Hence, the self-keeping secret. But this didn't deter Walter. Perhaps his greatest advantage was that he didn't know enough about the thing he was investigating to know how futile his mission was. He wanted to know the unknowable, and a pesky issue like impossibility wouldn't stop him. He'd get to whoever he needed to at Site-19 to get the answers he needed. Of course, most people had no knowledge of the mysterious anomaly. The common response he got back from his colleagues was, 055? Do we even have a 055? While the realization of sudden memory loss, or the realization of 055's existence, has been known to cause momentary stress, there are no known long-term physical or mental effects from 055's anomalous abilities. It's a fleeting idea in its purest form, like forgetting why you walked into a room. 055 could be the most harmless object on the Foundation's roster, or the most deadly. Either way, we just don't know. At times, Walter worried he was going insane. 055 and everything related to it was gaslighting him. Was 055 even real? The one thing that proved to him that 055 must have existed is that its containment chamber existed. According to the official records kept by the Foundation on the Site-19 containment facilities, 055 is kept in a 5 by 5 by 25 meter square room constructed of 50-foot thick cement with a Faraday cage surrounding the cement walls. The report continues that access is via a heavy containment door measuring 2 by 2.5 meters constructed on bearings to ensure door closes and locks automatically unless held open deliberately. 
055 cell is one of the few to have no posted security guards, and any personnel working on other SCPs in the area are ordered to remain at least 50 feet from the geometric center of 055 cell, where the anomaly itself is kept. When he tried to explore further why the cell was constructed in this manner, he found that, surprise surprise, nobody knew. 055 was an anomaly whose containment requirements were so mysterious that it automatically netted itself a Keter class designation. After all, how can you properly contain something you can't even hope to comprehend? There were plenty of rumors about the true nature of 055. Some of the more conspiratorial minds at Site-19 theorized that 055 was actually an autonomous or remotely controlled spy inserted into the site to observe Foundation operations or even humanity as a whole. If you're on the more paranoid end of the psychological spectrum, this theory makes total sense. An anomaly that's physically impossible to remember, even when writings and pictures on the subject exist, would be a perfect spy. However, this was all ultimately little more than speculation. Walter was barely any further along than when he started. There were multiple points in his investigations where Walter seriously considered giving up, until finally, he had a major breakthrough. Dr. Bartholomew Hughes and Dr. John Marichek were two scientists that had performed extensive research into 055, and who, Walter hoped, might have the answers he sought about the self-keeping secret. These scientists were the first to discover the anti-memetic nature of 055, performing numerous tests on D-Class personnel to see if it was possible to create feasible written records sketches, or any other records or impressions that could bypass its anomalous effects. The disorienting, memory-ruining effects of 055 also extend to any materials concerning 055. It seems to be a truly uncrackable code, but Dr. Hughes may have finally found some cracks in the armor. For starters, the fact that we're able to remember that 055 is an anti-memetic is an ironic exception to its anti-memetic qualities. This revelation also inspired another realization from Dr. Hughes. Would it be possible to discover more about 055 from the process of deduction rather than the typical induction? In other words, could they possibly learn about 055 by figuring out all the things it isn't rather than what it is? Dr. Marichek designed an experiment with Dr. Hughes to explore this theory. They designed the experiment around a simple question. Is 055 not spherical? In designing the question to specifically find out what 055 isn't, they hoped to subvert the anomaly's anti-memetic powers. Walter was fascinated by this potential method of getting answers. Marichek and Hughes found that, while the questioning process for those exposed was often arduous and frustrating, they could now definitely say that 055 is not a sphere. It is theoretically possible to discover the true nature of 055 by an almost endless barrage of deductive questions, though whether command would authorize the resources for such extensive testing is still an open question. Walter, in his desperation, begged Marichek and Hughes for clearance to view 055 himself. The curiosity had become too great during a search to just walk away with the single fact that 055 wasn't spherical. He needed to see this thing. And after several weeks of filling out forms and cutting red tape, his wish was finally granted. Walter Bainbridge was allowed a private audience with SCP-055, the subject of his months-long obsession. Outsiders observed that Walter spent just over an hour in the containment chamber, taking photos, drawing sketches, writing down notes, recording audio logs, and reciting memory mnemonics. He was pulling out every stop to counteract the anti-memetic effects of the self-keeping secret. He was adamant that he would not be defeated by his non-spherical nemesis, not after all this time and effort. Once his time in the 055 containment chamber was over, he retired back to his office to finally digitize his exhaustive findings, so that his supervisor, Mr. Kovach, would finally get off his back. Walter smiled, took a deep breath, and began to type. SCP-059, Keter class. This anomaly is a radioactive mineral that emits a unique radiation known as delta radiation. Exposure to this radiation has caused strange fungal growths on the infected... Wait, what was this supposed to be about again? Oh well, it couldn't have been that important. Does the Black Moon howl? No. 
not yet. See the boy. He was born in a time before names. There weren't enough humans around to need them back then. He was one of a handful occupying a coastal village, using a tongue long since dead. They eked out a simple life, hunting, gathering, fishing. The only thing on most of their minds was surviving to see the next sunrise. Yes, a simple life, free of complications. Until the hermit appeared. The boy would remember this man for eternity. Haggard and thin, skin weathered by time and pain. A man that, emaciated, walking with a long, gnarled cane that honestly looked healthier than he did, shouldn't be alive. Even the boy, who had scarcely seen beyond the bounds of his village, knew that the hermit was unnatural, an aberration, an anomaly. He walked into the center of the village, sat down on a large stone, and waited. Nobody dared ask his business, nor what the hermit waited for. Then, a few days later, the black moon howled. The boy saw the village's youngest hunter freeze one evening while out on a walk. Not simply stand still, but freeze. Then, for an instant, he became solid black, a coal statue, and as soon as he'd changed, he was gone. Obliterated, not a trace of him remained. Such is the power of the black moon. It can make any conscious being disappear in an instant, turn black, then wiped from our plane of existence, never to be seen again. Its choice of victims seemed, at each instance, to be utterly random, but it would come for all who lived eventually. This is known to some as the Howling of the Black Moon. Later that same night, the boy found himself talking to the hermit, who asked with small, frantic eyes what he had seen. When the boy told him, he let out a deep, rattling sigh. The boy, curious, asked him if he knew about the nightmare he'd just witnessed. The hermit looked up. He'd been the first one in the hermit's millennia of pursuit that had ever asked. In that moment, he knew that he had found his successor in the hunt for the death of ages. The hermit told the boy it went by many names. The Great Finale, the Pale King, but most common of all was the Black Moon. The entity existed beyond the veil of our reality, a creature of pure energy, though nobody could really be sure of its true nature. The Hermit had been tracking it, learning about it, and trying to destroy it for thousands of years. And yet it only took him four pathetic minutes to tell the boy everything he knew. The boy, knowing still that something about the Hermit was unnatural, asked how he came to be in this position. The Hermit told the boy he was the counterbalance, a kind of chosen one, destined to face and perhaps even defeat the Black Moon someday. The counterbalance receives a number of truly extraordinary gifts for inheriting the responsibility, eternal life, eternal youth, near physical immortality. But they will be haunted by their purpose, doomed to watch everyone they love die around them, as they continue to hunt their only true equal and opposite, the Black Moon itself. The hermit in his own eyes had failed at his duty. He had grown weary, and now he needed to pass the duty of counterbalance on to another. That other would be the boy. He felt a sudden and profound change, along with the knowledge that nothing would ever be the same again. He was no longer just the boy. Now, he was the counterbalance. He watched the hermit give him a slight nod of respect, and then crumble into dust before his eyes. The boy, the counterbalance, looked up at the sky and saw the stars twinkling, so bright and so beautiful. Little did he know his battle with the Black Moon would outlast every single one of them. Does the Black Moon howl? Not without blood. The boy grew into a man as his village aged and then died around him. Decades passed, then centuries, then millennia. Tens of thousands of years watching humanity develop and grow around him as he continued his pursuit of that one elusive foe. As science and diagnostic technology gained ground, absorbing and then evolving beyond all the old superstitions, the counterbalance gained a better understanding of the Black Moon, though even then, it still remained essentially a stranger. The entity was entropic, 
a being of pure randomness and chaos without consistent form. It didn't exist in our universe, but it could exercise its influence here with so-called obliteration events, much like the horrible fate that befell the young hunter from the village. But that was only the proverbial tip of the iceberg. The counterbalance tracked and noted obliteration events. They were exceedingly rare at first, something that occurred once every thousand years or so, like a terrible curse. But he couldn't help but notice a concerning trend emerging. It started happening once a century, then once a decade. He could feel the terrible future stretching out in front of him. How, over their shared eternity, the Black Moon would gain more and more ground. Would there come a day where it took someone once a year, once a month, a week, a day, an hour, a minute, a second? It'd spell the end of all conscious life. A total victory for the Black Moon. The end of the universe. The death of ages. A complete existential obliteration. He was swept up in a sobering realization. He couldn't win this fight alone. However, while his hunt for the Black Moon had been largely fruitless, the counterbalance had discovered many other things along the way. Strange creatures, objects with extraordinary powers, and events that couldn't be explained with rational science. Perhaps something about these oddities, these anomalies, would hold the key to defeating his timeless enemy. And it hadn't just been these objects, entities, and events. He'd also discovered some truly exceptional people on his travels, minds and skills that rivaled even his own, despite his age. Perhaps they would be the ones to help him win. With the 13 most brilliant and trusted people the counterbalance ever met, he decided to form a council. And from this council, they forged and directed an organization dedicated to understanding and counteracting the strange in all its forms with the secret hope that their search into darkness would yield the answer to the Black Moon's downfall. He called it the SCP Foundation. They would secure the anomalous, contain it, and protect all of humanity from its influence. The counterbalance also took on a new title, befitting of his new role, the Administrator. And even the Black Moon itself was given a moniker, in hopes of robbing it of some of its frightening power. SCP-001 Does the Black Moon Howl? Only at the Blind The year was now 1987. The SCP Foundation had been operating for over a century, and thanks to their secret possession of anomalous wisdom and technology, their own advancement was thousands of years ahead of the rest of humanity. While there still wasn't a silver bullet solution to the Black Moon, and its deadly howls were becoming all the more frequent as the decades went on, the Foundation did have some irons in the fire to combat it. Their ability to gather intel on both the entity itself and its obliteration events had improved considerably, thanks to their new global information network. Their top minds were also working on a highly classified device known as the Singular Conceptual Bunker, which may one day come in handy for combating the extra-dimensional entity directly. But the most valuable piece of information they ever gathered about the Black Moon was this. It couldn't howl when it was being watched. The very act of engaged observation defanged it. The problem is, how can you observe something that doesn't technically exist inside your own reality? In order to pull this off, the Foundation would need to get extremely creative. Thankfully, creative solutions to strange problems are the Foundation's specialty. Flash forward to 1993. Enter Dr. Moto a brilliant young scientist and conceptual engineer working for the SCP Foundation. With the administrator's consultation, he started the Key Project, an arm of the wider Project Oromasides, the umbrella initiative for using modified anomalous objects in the battle against the Black Moon. The goal of the Key Project was relatively simple. If people couldn't observe the Black Moon directly, then the Foundation could make proxies of the Black Moon that could be observed, almost like a kind of voodoo doll. These new anomalies would only need to satisfy three criteria. The inability to operate when being observed, a hostility to conscious life, and the ability to end conscious life of their own volition when not being observed. Through conceptual engineering, a link theoretically could be forged between these objects and the Black Moon, allowing observation of them to stop the obliteration events. However, despite being a good idea in theory, 
Dr. Moto's efforts were marred with errors and tragedies. One object wasn't deadly enough, simply appearing behind people in a threatening pose when they weren't looking. Another one killed purely through collateral damage, a giant sculpture of a human head that immediately attempted escape by barging through Site-01, the center for anti-Black Moon operations, and killing 19 people in the process. Another one of Moto's objects, a huge black sphere, simply immediately exploded, killing 12 people. And in the most horrific misstep of all, one of Moto's objects caused a mass death event in a nearby hotel, where 142 people were spontaneously incinerated when the object, a series of interlocking stalactites and stalagmites, were left unobserved for 0.2 seconds. Almost all of Moto's objects were terminated in the aftermath, either being too useless or too dangerous to keep around. The young scientist felt a deep shame but forged on. He made one truly brilliant creation that satisfied all the criteria. A sculpture, incapable of moving while being watched, but would snap the neck of the nearest conscious entity if it left unobserved for even a fraction of a second. Its relatively minimal killing left it easy to contain without causing mass deaths, and despite all the other deaths that had sadly occurred during the key project, Dr. Moto believed that the lives saved in the long run by stopping the Black Moon's howls would justify the sacrifice. The problem is, the key project didn't stop anything. Not long after this, there was the first recorded double obliteration event in Rome, where a young tourist couple had both been obliterated simultaneously. All the deaths in the key project had been for nothing. The Black Moon was only getting more powerful. The shame and the guilt was too much for Dr. Moto. He left a note in his office reading, We've been looking at nothing. I'm sorry, Administrator. I failed you, sir. Moto's corpse was later found in the sculpture's temporary containment chamber. His neck snapped. The key project was, in summary, shut down, and its one surviving creation transported to Site-19 in late 1993, where it was designated as SCP-173. Another painful failure for the Administrator. Back to the drawing board once more. Does the black moon howl? Not while the stars shine. Millennia stretched on. Almost everyone died except the administrator thanks to his gift. Or perhaps curse. As the calendar balanced to the black moon, science marched on. The SCP Foundation marched on. But all this progress, all this power, was nothing against the incomprehensible influence of SCP-001. The black moon was howling more frequently than ever all the way up to the year 3156, when the Foundation launched the SEEK project under the support of Project Oromastes. As more and more people were wiped out in frequent obliteration events, the Administrator became painfully aware that perhaps the answers to the Black Moon problem wouldn't be found on Earth. Using state-of-the-art technology, with a little help from the Anomalous, the SCP Foundation began work on an autonomous spacefaring vessel that could search the stars for the key to the Black Moon's destruction. It was an awe-inspiring creation. A huge craft powered by artificial intelligence with a universal translator, cryogenic units, and hundreds of autonomous drones to perform more targeted searches. Seek was waved off into the unforgiving depths of space. The administrator could only hope that it would come back with worthwhile answers. The first of the three notable planets Seek derived on was one theoretically capable of supporting human life, except for its brutal and constant blizzards and snowstorms. When Seek's drones were deployed, they did discover signs of civilization based around sentient spherical creatures, but no signs of actual life remained. Records and statues found across the planet seem to indicate that the Black Moon was responsible for the destruction of the planet's civilization, causing so many obliteration events that the remaining survivors went mad from the fear and stress, leading to mass death in the ensuing chaos. The next planet was discovered centuries later, in the year 3499. While this planet could also theoretically support human life, it suffered from frequent volcanic eruptions that rendered much of its surface a flaming mess. However, there were still the dormant ruins of a once advanced civilization of conscious beings. Much like the prior planet, they'd been driven extinct by Black Moon obliteration events a century before the Seek even arrived. Unlike the last planet, however, it seems that they accepted their fate and went gently into the night. The planet was now overrun by billions of armored bat-like creatures that operated on pure instinct, 
and thus were not considered conscious enough to be obliterated. The final planet was reached in 3764 and was the most fruitful of the three discoveries. This planet was hyper-advanced, fully urbanized, and covered in sprawling megacities, with records and technology over a thousand years ahead of Earth. Before the Black Moon killed almost all of them, there were a species of humanoid telepathic fungi, and had developed an awareness of the Black Moon's existence that was on par with that of humanity's. They even had their own equivalent of the SCP Foundation actively working on countermeasures. And most amazingly of all, Seek found one surviving member of the species on the planet, cryogenically frozen. The craft was immediately instructed to collect the survivor and return home for interrogation. The administrator was preparing for what could be the most important conversation since he met the hermit all those thousands of years ago. Does the Black Moon howl? Only when waning. When the surviving creature, codenamed Sage, was returned to Earth, the administrator was eager to finally speak with it. Like the rest of its now extinct species, Sage spoke through powerful telepathic mind waves, which only the administrator, thanks to his counterbalance abilities, was able to receive at close range without being harmed. Incidentally, it wasn't long until the very fact of the administrator's nature as a counterbalance came up in the mental conversation. Sage could tell, just by being in his presence. They discovered a number of vital truths over their brief time communicating, that Sage's survival had been pure luck, for starters. The Black Moon is still very much capable of obliterating conscious beings in an unconscious state. The administrator also learned that he was merely the latest in an extremely long line of counterbalances across time, space, and species, though everyone but him had waived this duty, passed it on. Sage had one question to ask the administrator in turn, what is SCB? The singular conceptual bunker, being worked on and perfected for thousands of years by now, by the Foundation's top scientists and conceptual engineers. The administrator replied, Victory, but it will take a very, very long time. Specifically, so long that he would see the stars go out around him, one by one. Shocked, Sage asked him what good victory would do him then. Rather than say it aloud, he replied with a thought. Sage paused and said, I see. How blasphemous of you. Hopefully it works. After this, the administrator proceeded to the singular conceptual bunker and entered it, leaving instructions for the Foundation to be run by a newly formed O5 Council in his indefinite absence. Thousands of years later, in the year 5011, Sage spoke one more time, repeating the words, hopefully, hopefully, before turning solid black and disappearing. The Black Moon had claimed one more victim, but billions more had gone in the interim. The administrator had no more answers to give, at least no more answers that anyone but him would understand. He was inside the singular conceptual bunker now, loaded into a device known as Tome, an experimental memorial module meant to pick up and record all the last messages of every dying civilization across the universe when the time finally came. All he could do was wait, and wait was exactly what we did. Does the Black Moon howl? Yes, yes it does. Years pass, too many to count. It's a time after names now, and Tome sits in the very center drinking in the end of the universe. The last of all the human colonies across the universe were obliterated by the Black Moon back in the year 7329. So, so, so long ago. But some of the final messages of fear, panic, and distress still echoed around in the administrator's mind. Hello? Is there anyone here? We require assistance. There's... It's, it's taking people every day. We need help. There's barely anyone left. We need help. Hello? Hello? Cabal 0943, we have abandoned the false flesh. We have abandoned the false flesh. The shepherd's crook broken neath my knee. Cabal 0943, Cabal 0943, forgive us! Forgive us! We're going to leave this on. It's so dark outside now. It's blotted out the sun. It's... I have to go now. Respond. First convenience. Emergency. Situation developing. Require additional resources. My fault, your fault, our fault, my fault, your fault, our fault, my fault, your fault, our fault! Rip my brain out now, rip my brain out now! And a small child, the last on Earth, simply asking, Hello? into an indifferent microphone. 
but the administrator had to wait, as the singular conceptual bunker became the solitary conceptual bunker. He was the last conscious being in the universe, and still he needed to wait as the stars went dark outside. Only when there was nothing outside but black was it finally time for the counterbalance's long game to play off. There was nothing left of our universe. The only thing here was the SCB and the Black Moon itself. With everything else gone, the Black Moon only had one conscious being left to obliterate. It opened the door to the solitary conceptual bunker and stepped inside. This… this doesn't make sense. How can the Black Moon, an entity beyond our dimension, beyond physical form, take a step? Good question. The same question, incidentally, that was going through the Black Moon's mind as it entered the bunker. It didn't look at all how the entity expected. It was like a bar, a counter, with rows of bottles behind it, a jukebox playing in the corner. A man stood behind the bar cleaning the glasses. The counterbalance. The administrator. He said, <laughs> well there you are. Certainly took your time. Can I pour you a little something? This only served to increase the Black Moon's confusion. It had form here, dark smoke compressed into a vaguely humanoid shape. It could speak, it could think. None of this made any sense. The being that had just wiped out all conscious life and seen the very death of the universe was truly and utterly confused. The administrator just seemed to be enjoying himself, preparing for a confrontation hundreds of billions of years in the making. The singular conceptual bunker, or perhaps the singular containment bunker, was a truly ingenious creation. A place of pure ideas, where everything inside was on the same level. Here there were no immortals, no gods, just ideas on the same level playing field. And it was time for the Black Moon's idea to come to an end. It was a trap, and the entire universe was the bait. Without warning, the administrator pulled up a shotgun from underneath the table and unleashed both barrels into the Black Moon's chest. The creature took the hit and fought back, dragging the administrator to the ground, beating him, strangling him. He could feel the light fading under the monster's relentless assault, until he managed to get his desperate hands on a glass ashtray. He beat the monster over the head with it until its grip loosened, and he was able to slide out. There, the killer of the universe was on the ground before him, he grabbed the monster, held it in place, and beat it to death. He was gravely injured by the battle, but the Black Moon was no more. Here in the singular conceptual bunker, he had won. The administrator, no longer the counterbalance in the absence of the Black Moon, hobbled over to the jukebox, produced a single beautiful coin from his pocket. He pushed the coin into the slot, wheezed a pain breath, and said, The thing is... This place is only information. There's nothing else out there. Not even matter. The universe closed its doors a long time ago. This place can go from information back to matter with just the press of a button. <laughs> Let's see what happens when we introduce something to nothing. For a second it looks as though he might fall, but he doesn't. Instead, he slams the button on the jukebox and with a relieved laugh says, Let there be light. And there was light. Now go check out SCP-001, which is the real 001, and SCP-001-EX, a good boy, to unravel more of the many mysteries of the legendary SCP-001.